The fifth meeting of the 26th Council will come to order. All councilors are present this evening. I will start with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilor Grout, and the uh, Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish, led by, led by Councilor Pena. A moment of silence first, and then the Pledge of Allegiance. The Civic Plaza passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from the council staff at the table near the chamber's entrance. Members of the public, city staff, the media have the ability to view this meeting in person, live, live streams through four different platforms on GovTV, on Comcast 16, uh, the GovTV website, YouTube, uh, Zoom, Zoom webinar. The live streams can be assessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you can maybe enable the closed captioning services on your television device at this time. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the council's website. Uh, council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening, if needed. With regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceeding to be as civil, respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks. Uh, please, no applause or outbursts during the meeting. This meeting will go a lot further if we're respectful of, uh, of one another. And uh, we have some other just instructions on decorum, and, uh, and that's available in, in the back, and you're welcome to, uh, to read those. Uh, we're going to start with proclamations and presentations. We have three presentations tonight. The first is um, a presentation of Dr. Michelle Sanchez, Director of Arts and Culture. Provide an update regarding Route 66 revitalization. This is Councilor Pena. Sorry, sorry, Councilor Pena, I read that. We'll let you introduce them. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Mr. President, that's fine. Um, Dr. Sanchez, I think she's here somewhere. It doesn't look like maybe she's arrived yet. Yeah, so why don't we move on to Councilor Bassan, if you'd like, and we'll defer. She's not here. Okay. Well, let's go on to uh, Councilor Bassan's presentation of um, uh, National Institute of, of Flamenco. Mr. President, uh, thank you. It's my honor to uh, have requested the presentation for uh, the National Institute of Flamenco. Tonight we have Ms. Marisol Encinas. I believe we also have Eva Encinas, Eloy Gonzalez, and Vininos y Tinos Flamencos. So, uh, Marisol, I went and toured the facility. I think that, you know, we've worked well, I think, as a city and as the council to make sure that we are collaborating and doing what we can to support many different programs. But this is the one that I think was very beneficial, and I, I thought it could be fun and festive for us to see a little bit of what they do and also hear what the National Institute of Flamenco does beyond just teaching flamenco. So, Marisol, welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, President Lewis and members of the City Council. We appreciate being invited to be here today. As she said, my, as Councilor Bazan said, my name is Marisol Encinas. I'm the Executive Director of the National Institute of Flamenco. For nearly a century, my family has practiced and shared flamenco with our community. My mother, Eva Encinas, founded the National Institute of Flamenco in 1982, where we have seen decades of flamenco's power to improve the lives of children and families in Albuquerque. We serve all districts of Albuquerque with excellent flamenco performances and classes. We have expanded outreach offerings across the city. We are working on improving pay for our teaching artists and performers, continue to produce the largest, most important flamenco festival outside of Spain each year. And last year, this festival alone generated over 12 million economic impact dollars for the city of Albuquerque. Arts and culture industries account for one in 18 jobs in New Mexico, and we at the National Institute of Flamenco are a major employer in the industry. We believe that our neighbors in Albuquerque deserve to express themselves, thrive, and enjoy vibrant arts that speak to our culture. 
We respectfully ask for your consideration for funding for the fiscal year 2025 budget. We also hope that we can count on your support. It's my pleasure right now to introduce Eva Ancinias, my mother, who's spearheaded, who's the reason we do all of this now, Eloy Gonzalez, our incredible guitarist, and the, company, the student company members of Niños and Tinos, who are gonna dance for you right now. Our young students who are all representing different districts from Albuquerque are going to say quick words. Um, hello, I'm Aliyah Trujillo. I live in District 1. Um, <laughs> I've been dancing flamenco for six years, and I love flamenco because it's part of how I connect to my culture and my history. Venice lives in District 3. <laughs> I'm Jaden Grammer, and I live in District 4. I love flamenco because it gave me a second family, and they support me in countless ways, and it's so much more than just dance. Sophia lives in District 5. Six. I'm Bianca Mijares. I live in District 9. Um, I'm the Education Programs Manager at the National Institute of Flamenco. I moved here from Miami, Florida to take this position. And um, as you can see, it's very inspiring to see the effect that flamenco has had on the youth of Albuquerque. And again, my name is Marisol Encinas, and I live in District 1. 
And, I, and so the National Institute of Flamenco is also our facilities in District 1. And we thank you for your consideration and for your time. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, Mr. President. I just want to say that this was a great performance. And, and I want to make sure that people understand. And counselors, if you haven't toured with Marisol, please reach out to her because it is so much more than, uh, honestly, and I don't mean any disrespect, but it's more than just teaching people how to flamenco dance. This institute is so much more. It does so much um, for their creative education and growth as well. So I really appreciate the, the time that we allowed for them to present and for them all coming to be here. Well, we'll go to our next presentation by uh, Councilor, or Councilor, present, or Councilor Kraut is presenting the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. At, at this time, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Mr. Eric Garcia. He is the super, superintendent of police reform to provide information about police reform. Good evening, Council President, Councilor Grout. Uh, as stated, I'm Eric Garcia. I'm the Superintendent of Police Reform. And um, first slide we'll start with will be our organizational structure. So as you can see, is we are separated from the Chief of Police. So I don't answer to Chief Medina at all. I answer to uh, Mr. Kevin Sorso, who's the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Working for me, I have two majors, Major James Collins and Acting Major Dodi Camacho. Beneath uh, each of them, they have commanders working for them on each side. So Major Jimmy Collins is in charge of the disciplinary review process. That's the process that reviews every single disciplinary action that comes through the department. Um, the reason we created this section was because we were having trouble meeting the requirements of the consent decree because we had over 20 disciplinary authorities throughout the department. We now have cut that down to four, and now we are very close to being in compliance with these paragraphs that involve our disciplinary review process. Uh, beneath uh, Jimmy Collins are Commanders Henry Londavazo and Commander Sean Waite. They are the professional integrity commanders. They are the first two commanders that review disciplinary cases, misconduct cases for our department. On the other side is Acting Major Dodi Camacho. She is over both Internal Affairs Divisions. So we have two Internal Affairs Divisions, the Internal Affairs Force Division and the Internal Affairs Professional Standards Division. The, professional, the Internal Affairs Professional Standards Division is your uh, standard internal affairs that most departments have that deals strictly with misconduct from internal complaints. The Force Division investigates all uses of force, all level, all level two and three uses of force. Um, if any misconduct is generated from use of force, that is either handled by the force division itself or the professional standards division. And this is a breakdown of each of the two divisions. So we have one commander under the force division, four deputy commanders one lieutenant and five sergeants. Currently, we have a total of 23 investigators. Six are sworn detectives and 17 are civilian investigators. We've actually done really well and, and found our civilian investigators have done a really good job investigating uses of force and misconduct. Um, so it has really helped the department and helped uh, many levels throughout the rest of the department. Uh, below the detectives, we have our administrative staff, and uh, our contact employees who help prepare the presentations for the force review board. On the right hand side, for internal affairs professional standards, we have one commander who's uh, acting commander Ken Johnston. We have one deputy commander, one intake manager, and the intake manager is very critical to the entire process. So whenever possible misconduct is identified in the department, uh, we call it, we, an, an internal affairs request is completed. We call it an IAR. That is generated through the, through the application, the web application, Blue Team. 
It goes to our intake manager, who's Olivia Mora. She determines, she, she evaluates the blue team entry, determines if it's a violation and where it's going to go for investigation. So an investigation for misconduct could go back to the area command if it's a minor investigation, let's say a class six or seven, which is our lowest. Uh, it could be sent to Internal Affairs Force Division if it came from that division, or it could be investigated by Internal Affairs Professional Standards. So that position is very, very critical. We have one lieutenant, two sergeants, and in professional standards, we have a total of 11 investigators. Uh, five of them are detectives and six are civilian investigators. And of course, we have our administrative staff. I'm gonna explain the intake process a little more in detail now. So when an IAR, the internal affairs request is submitted, it goes to the intake manager, like I said, Olivia Mora, from Olivia, she routes it either to Internal Affairs Professional Standards, Internal Affairs Force Division, or the Area Command for investigation. Once that investigation is completed, uh, a packet called the Disciplinary Action Packet is completed by the appropriate Internal Affairs. What that does is it lists the violations that are sustained in the investigation, and it lists the possible range of any disciplinary action that might happen. From there, it goes to the Professional Integrity Commander Review. It's a two-level review by each commander. So one commander will review it, either Londa Vaza or Wait, and then the other one will review it. From there, it goes to Major Collins for review. And if, it's, if the disciplinary action is below 40 hours, uh, Major Collins will conduct the predetermination hearing on that case. If there's an appeal from that case, I will handle the appeal. If the disciplinary action is 40 hours or greater, I handle a predetermination hearing on that case. Any appeals from my decision will go to the personnel board. Currently, we have a couple of different reports that are online. Uh, we just started now in January, our Internal Affairs Force Division monthly use of force reports. That's on the website. It's listed on the slide. Um, we'll be doing this every month from now on. January was the first one. Each month, we'll be adding our statistics for each month into this website. Uh, on Internal Affairs Professional Standards, we do a quarterly report, and that's also on the city website. That's basically a brief overview. I want to emphasize that the chief of police and I, although we work together, we are separate. So. My decisions go answer directly to the mayor's office, um, and it's made for a reason that way. That way, he can handle the operations of the department, and I handle any disciplinary actions and any internal investigations on any cases that might arise. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. This is very interesting. Um, I know that the CPOA is completely different. Do you ever have anything to do with them? Uh, yes. So I review every CPOA case that they investigate. So the CPOA, they handle external complaints. So citizen complaints go into the CPOA. Okay. They conduct their investigation, and I review each one of those. Um, the, the executive director, uh, Diane McDermott, will make recommendations. And from there, it goes through a similar process through our professional integrity division and up through the same uh, review process as our internal complaints. How did you, um, thank you, how did you um, come up with having um, so many investigators? That's, you have quite a few. Is that necessary? To have? Um, Council President, Councilor Grout, uh, yes, we determined, well, first, from the, for the force division, we were under a stipulated order to have a minimum of 25 investigators. We've mm -hmm. realized we can do that with a shorter number. We've completed that order, so now we've got 23 in there right now. Okay. With the professional standards investigators, uh, right now, they are handling probably about 10 to 12 investigations apiece. So due, due to the number of complaints we're getting internally, because of the internal affairs requests, uh, actually, I'm probably going to need a couple more in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, are you caught up on all of your complaints? How long does it typically take to um, complete an investigation? So in the investigations, um, we have 120 days to complete an investigation per the contract with the union. Yeah. Um, our investigations are usually completed before then. So right now, we're right on schedule. 
Also, there's also a timeline for our use of force cases, and that's where that backlog had occurred in the past. But since we've taken over from EFIT and since EFIT has been here, we have not added any more cases to that backlog. So we are keeping on pace with that unit as well. Good. Um, how how uh, far out are you on having all of the backlog taken care of? From what I understand, uh, Mr. Nyer from EFIT uh, stated we are on pace to be done by May. Of this in a couple months, that's great. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate this. Council? Um, Council President, uh, Council Vice President, I just wanted to add that the 25 um, was negotiated with the Department of Justice and there was a stipulated order entered and then we negotiated for the lower number recently. And, and uh, it is also my understanding that EFIT is very close to being done. That's great. Thank you for that follow up. Uh, Council Champagne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Deputy Chief, um, it, it shows in your report here that you have 58 total uh, use of forces investigations, level one, two, and three during January of 24. Um, is this an average, uh, say, last year? Did you average 60 a month of just a use of force? Council President, Councillor Champagne, yes, that's about, we vary anywhere between 40 and about 70, depending on the month. Of course, the summer months, as you can, as you know, we're busier and we have more uses of force. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Deputy Chief, what's the difference, and this is just kind of to clarify, what's the difference between the, the three levels of investigations for the use of force? So a level one use of force is any force that uh, there's no injury to the individual. It can be resisted handcuffing, something of that sort. If there's an injury, that's a level two. Um, of course, or if they complain of injury, it's a level two. Uh, a level three is uh, serious, or it has serious injury, of course, our officer-involved shootings are level threes. Okay. And one last question, Mr. President. Uh, Deputy Chief, compared to the use of force, um, how, many does, how many investigations does professional standards have on average a month? You know, Council President, Councilor Champagne, uh, are you asking for the number of investigations per detective? Yes. So currently, our professional standards detectives or investigators, they're handling between 10 and 12. Our use of force investigators are handling about five. Okay. okay. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Council President, no, in fact, it is not mandated by the CASA, and it was a decision of this administration, and the Department of Justice has made clear that we do not need to have this uh, separate, this department be separate. What was mandated was that we had 25 investigators uh, available to conduct use of force investigations. Yes. All that's under your, your department. Sorry, my phone, microphone was off. Council President, yes. Both internal affairs are under me. How many homicide detectives do we have in the department? Uh, Council President, uh, I'm not sure how many homicide detectives that we have. I can get that information for you, though. There are auto theft detectives. Do you know how many total detectives we have in the in APD? Council President, uh, no, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think mean, we'll go to uh, Councilor Sanchez. Maybe if uh, the chief's here, one of his staff, he can help us with that. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. You were actually answered that question. I was going to ask. Um, City legal, if that was a mandated uh, part of the DOJ, but um, since we're on a question, um, is this supposed to be an independent entity, um, kind of looking over police reform? Um, what's the purpose? Um, Council President, Council Sanchez, again. The existence of the Office of Police Reform is not mandated by the CASA, so that's really a question for the administration. Council President, um, Councillor Sanchez, um, you know, I think the administration made the decision that it was valuable for us to have that the uh, Office of the Superintendent of Police Reform to be independent of the P police department, to give the community a sense of um, confidence that the um, superintendent would be acting on these investigations and reviewing for police reforms as the CASA has expected. As we said, it isn't required for the independence, but it was designed to provide um, that extra layer of independence to ensure 
that um, when we have special situations that might call for um, independent review, there's that confidence in that. Okay, so you're telling me the mayor works, the police chief works under the mayor, and now um, the independent office works, or the police reform office works under the mayor. What's the difference? There is, it still works on, it's still under the mayor's administration. So, I mean, the concept sounds good, but it should be totally independent or make it make some sense in terms of, I mean, you're still underneath the same mayor. I mean, if the, it, so to me, um, it's still not an entity that, uh, in totality, that I would think um, needs to be here. Um, it's still under the mayor's office. I think it should be separate from the mayor's office so that there is no, um, no, any kind of uh, uh, appearance of impropriety. Um, and I think it should be 100% separate. And I think that we should be able to have uh, set it up like the AGO or one of these other entities where, where um, somebody from council picks someone, someone from the mayor's office picks someone, and then they pick the third individual to handle um, reform. To me, that would be more um, transparent, and it would lead to um, more accountability within within city government and within the police department. Mr. President, I just would uh, say that you know, as the charter is set up for the administration of the of the city, um, the police department and um, the investigations within the police department are um, within the administration's responsibility. We believe we've set up. Um, an arrangement that allows for an appropriate level of um, independence with the Office uh, for, of Police Reform. Um, and as we said, we've gone beyond what is expected from the CASA and the DOJ um, to do so. And we believe it is a um, decision that has been an effective one for supporting uh, our work as we move forward. What, what distinguishes, um, I guess, the reform department from from internal affairs, I mean, how would you say that distinguishes, you distinguish yourself from them? Council President, um, internal affairs is part of the Office of the Superintendent. So the Office of the Superintendent and the Police Reform Bureau, those are interchangeable. Internal affairs are basically part of the whole Reform Bureau, the Office of the Superintendent. What, what, what do you do, though? I mean, I, we, we call them. I know it's one, one is mo mostly independent, but what do you do that's different than internal affairs? We are internal affairs. So we handle all misconduct complaints. We investigate all uses of force and any uses of force that arise from, any misconduct complaints that arise from uses of force. We also administer any disciplinary action to anybody in the department. Um, and I am the final disciplinary authority for APD. So you're internal affairs? Yes, sir. So what, but you're called reform, I mean, what dis, you know, distinguishes you in the area of reform? What do you do that is in the area of reform that's different than what an internal affairs department would do? Well, part of our reason, we're under, uh, Council President, part of the reason we're under the consent decree is that uh, supervision was a huge part of our, our issues with the department. We weren't holding our officers accountable, and we weren't being impartial and, and fair through officers throughout the whole department. That's why we've created this this office of the superintendent to administer discipline fair and impartial, uh, and it's consistent throughout the whole department. And that is, is why we've been moving forward with the paragraphs uh, with the CASA. And so is there, is there an end goal to reform, or is this a perpetual um, project? I mean, just, just the name, or the, 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 the word reform has a, um, a meaning of at some point, reform happens. You know? So do you see yourself as a, uh, uh, is there an end goal uh, a year from now, two years from now? Council President, I anticipate um, the Office of the Superintendent continuing. And I agree with you. I think reform needs to have an end goal. Um, when we do get out of the CASA, I believe it should strictly be named the Office of the Superintendent. It will still have internal affairs both internal affairs beneath it and the disciplinary review process. Um, but I do believe it should continue um, because it's allowed the department to reform and to meet the DOJ standards and to move forward. I think right now we're a much better department than we were. There'll be a point when the DOJ is gone. There'll be a, a point when the, the CASA is gone. 
Um, but do you see a point where, or a point where the Office of Reform will be done reforming? Council President, I believe be con the, this office will continue to be doing this job it's doing. Um, it may not be called reform, but it will still be doing the same job because unfortunately we're still going to have police misconduct and we're going to continue to have uses of force. Um, there's no way to get around for any metropolitan police department to not have uses of force. You see a name change happening at some point, uh, and maybe everything just kind of goes back into internal affairs, and yet we have just a huge, massive, you know, department now. I mean, again, I mean, I'm interested in our, are we answering how many homicide detectives we have? Council President, we have 16 detectives in the homicide unit and two sergeants currently. Thanks. So how, how many total detectives do you have in the department? In the department? <clears throat> I'm trying to do some quick math, sir. No problem. Take your time. Oh. Mr. President, while he's waiting for that information, I have another question for the administration. Um, Dr. Single, um, we just heard that, um, that this entity was created in reference to um, being impartial, fair, and consistent. So are we saying that we weren't impartial, impartial fair, and cons consistent? prior to the creation of this entity? Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, I don't believe it was a statement about um, beliefs of or, or classification prior. I think it's about the mission and focus of what the department is supposed to be doing um, for the, um, as the su superintendent of police reform office. So they weren't doing, based on what you just said, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing prior to? Mr. That's President, I mean. Mr. Uh, Councillor Sanchez, that is not what I said. I said I believe it was not a statement or classification of the previous, but the intent of what they are meant to do in the role that they have and that were defined to do. And as was stated, you know, an internal affairs has been a function, and this was to pull that separately and apart and give this, them the opportunity to do this work um, independently from the police department chain of command. Thank you. Please, sir. Hey, ahead, Council, sir. Council President, we have 153 detectives assigned to the investigative bureau. Okay. And, uh, and, and those all include what type of, I mean, it, you have 16 homicide, and what, what are some it, of the general other? It includes um, on the criminal investigation bureau side, it's going to include homicide, robbery, cold case, missing persons, uh, sex crimes, crimes against children. Um, on the investigative service division, it's going to include our investigative service division our gun violence suppression unit, our gun violence reduction unit, our narcotics team, um, our, um, our OCU, which is our organized crime unit, our impact, and our property crimes as well. Okay. You know about how many in narco narcotics? Narcotics, there's eight detectives and one sergeant. Okay. And you're, are you, in that total amount, are you including the investigators and reform? This, is not, this is not including professional staff. Okay. Like Are you instance, shorthanded anywhere? Um, we have short, short, I mean, if you're actually like where we should be, um, I think we have done a great job of having professional staff. Like you had asked about the uh, auto theft detectives. We have seven and one sergeant, but we also included professional staff to assist with like the bait car operations and uh, that sort of course. So we've been able to implement professional staff just like Superintendent Garcia has stated where we had lack with um, some sworn personnel, we've been able to fill it with perf professional staff to help assist with that. What would you say, though, that you need more investigators? Um, I, I don't, I mean, we would always love more officers on the department, but right now we're functioning, and as you can heard before, we've been reducing crime, so I think we're at a great place. We could always improve. 
So your investigators are not, uh, you're not shorthanded anyway is what you're saying? Your, your investigators are able to handle everything that's coming before them? Yes, sir. You're not shorthanded at all? Yes, sir. You're not going to need any more money this year for more We would love more money. We would love more equipment. We would love more officers. I can tell you that. Well, you got to need them first, right? I mean, you have to make the case that, hey, we need more, op we need more we, investigators, Of course, right? we would always need Otherwise, more Otherwise, we're not going to give you money for it. Of course. We, it, gotcha. It's, well, thank you. And, and, and Superintendent, thanks for, the, thanks for the presentation as well. Appreciate it. I think we might have one more question. Councilor Champlain. I'm sorry. Just a point of clarification. Um, I didn't, you don't, you don't have a gangs unit anymore? Uh, we have a gun violence uh, that, suppression okay. unit. That's where, okay. yes. And in, in Intel? You still yes, have Intel? we have Intel and our investigative service, um, our electronic support unit. And we have Intel as well. That's some of the units that I, yes, what we do. Oh, okay. I, I didn't hear that. I apologize. And then just one point of clarification for uh, Deputy Chief. Um, when officers are presented with 40 hours or above or 80 hours of discipline, that goes to you and not to the chief anymore? Council President, Councilor uh, Champagne. That's correct. It comes to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a quick question about the current investigation for our chief. Is that's under yours, under the IAPS, the professional side, or not use of force? Uh, Council President, Council Rogers, uh, the incident with the chief involves basically two separate channels. Um, one's the crash, which goes before the crash review board, and the other one goes to internal affairs. That's the one for a possible OBRD, that's the on-body recording device violation that he self-reported, that is coming to internal first professional standards. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, do you think that you're going to do a fair and impartial, um, consistent investigation on the police chief, being that he's been your boss for uh, many years? Council President, Councilor Sanchez. Um, yes, I do. I believe it will be fair, and I will make. I do not make the final decision on the chief's case. That will go to the CAO, but I will be the first reviewer of that case. Um, but yes, I do believe it would be fair. Unfortunately, I've had to discipline a couple of other deputy chiefs while being in this position. It's not a very good thing. I don't. I don't like doing that, but it's something that I've had to do. We heard it here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All. Sure. All right, we have the, the other presentation ready to go. Council opinion. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, uh, Director Sanchez, I think, is here. And I'll turn it over to her. As you all know, we're working on the Route 66 celebration. We're working on a multifaceted uh, approach to looking at um, infrastructure and, and um, also part of the celebration. So I think uh, Director Sanchez is going to give us a great overview on, on what the progress is so far. Council, Council President Lewis, Councilor Pena, thank you so much for this opportunity. We actually have um, presentation part A and part B on the Route 66 Centennial. Um, I also brought uh, Tanya. To the Route 66 celebration in a couple years. So I will go ahead and give you a quick overview. Um, we did send out some uh, information to you via email a couple of weeks ago, and I have most of that reprinted and a little bit updated um, to send home with you tonight in case, you know, you want to read it in real life. Okay, let's see. Um, so I think before we get started, just for people that are watching, I know everyone here is very aware of the Route 66 Centennial, but in 2026, the Route 66 um, will turn 100 officially. This is when it was, um, as the federal charter was in November of, um, well, let's see, when was that? 1926, sorry, how to do the math there. Um, so it'll be turning 100 years old. That's not exactly when it started in um, New Mexico, but 
Uh, it covers eight states, um, starts in Chicago, ends in um, Santa Monica, I believe, officially. Uh, New Mexico has a very long stretch, and of course Albuquerque has a very long stretch. We typically refer to it as Central Avenue. Um, the historic Route 66 goes right through the center of our city, um, all the way from the mountains to the volcanoes, and it's 18, I think, 0.6 miles long through the, um, through the center of our city. So we've been, we started working on this thanks to um, a lot of encouragement and support from city council. So thank you so much. We started working on this um, really with uh, a nudge from Councilor Pena in 2022. So we've been doing a lot of work. I will say we, um, we've, we are ahead of a lot of cities in the state and we're ahead of a lot of states. So we're really proud of this. Um, this is all the departments that are actively involved in um, preparing for the Route 66 Centennial. Uh, uh, there's um, our public safety departments, planning, metropolitan redevelopment, parks and recreation, arts and culture, transit, and I probably forgot someone. Oh, um, equity and inclusion and um, health, the new HHH. And then we have a lot of external partners who have already come on board and are doing active work with us. So we've got Visit Albuquerque, um, National Parks, National Trust for His Historic Preservation, Friends of the Orphan Sign, which is a local nonprofit, RIPE, which is a branding firm, uh, New Mexico, UNM Libraries, UNM College of Fine Arts, and New Mexico Main Street. These are all organizations that we're already um, actively engaged in terms of projects or funding. Um, in 2022, we started some community engagement where we did interviews with a lot of stakeholders these are just some examples, um, and we, we spent about eight months talking to a lot of different organizations and individuals and business owners. And we heard a lot of things. Um, and um, out of that, one of the things that came out of all of those community conversations was putting together a community committee. So we started meeting with that committee. We meet every other month. It's um, a very diverse group. It's in your handouts. It shows you everyone who's on that um, committee right now. Um, very excited, engaged group of business owners, nonprofit leaders, um, neighborhood association, people from UNM, all up and down the corridor. We heard a lot of, we've heard a lot of different things about Route 66, and um, some of this is also in your handouts. But, I think it's just what it reminds us is that the community has a lot of different feelings about the past, the present, and also the future of Route 66, which means that our efforts really need to be broad and they need to be um, diverse and various. And that's what we're really trying to do um, as, you know, as a, as a citywide effort. So some people are concerned they don't want us to just be celebrating the 1950s version of Route 66. Um, some people want us to only celebrate the 1950s version of Route 66. Um, some people only want to be looking forward. Some people only want to talk about um, external visitors and tourists. Some people want to talk about housing and all of these things along Central. So it just reminds us that we really, as a city and as um, city leadership and as departments, we need to be looking at all of these pieces together. So these are just a few of the things that our department is really focused on. Um, you know, we already do a lot of really um, strong programming along Route 66, but as we look forward to the celebration, which we're planning to launch in May of 2025, because we want to have two full seasons, two full summer and fall seasons of um, really actively promoted uh, activities along the corridor. So, you know, a lot of that will be building on things we already have trying to um, advertise that more, but also maybe bring in higher level um, entertainment and to kind of amplify these celebrations so they're a real destination for visitors. Um, and then also some new things. We're looking at some augmented reality um, apps um, so that people have places to, to go along the route and really appeal to a younger audience um, using technology in a new way to share the history and the culture and the place. Um, public art. Um, some real good partnerships with other arts and cultural nonprofits and businesses. And I think that's one of the things that we are really invested in. We know this is going to be strong 
if everyone up and down the corridors is participating. The city itself can't do the level of programming alone that's going to really make this special. So we've, that's why we have our community committee. That's why we're working on ways to really partner with businesses, arts and cultural nonprofits, UNM, all of these other places that are along the route to make sure that a lot is happening in 2025 and 26. Um, we've already started a few historic preservation projects. Um, right now, we're working on a neon, um, like a kind of history of Albuquerque neon. That's funded by the National Park Service. Um, you know, there's an effort to get Central Avenue Bridge designated as a historic landmark. Um, the Transit Department and the Albuquerque Museum, not a typical partnership, are working together on a collaboration. They've already started on that. Uh, and then we're looking at other partnerships like the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is a national organization, um, to do some work in the International District. And then the Albuquerque Museum is working on an exhibit as well. Um, we've got a lot of corridor improvements going on across all of the departments. Um, the revamp Route 66 sign improvement project, block by block cleaning, the International District Library Park is um, slated to be completed by 2025, late 2025, I believe. Um, and then just a lot of other projects, median improvements, code enforcement and compliance, outdoor fire operations. A lot of things, things are already happening, and they will just continue to strengthen over the next couple years. A lot of this is much more in detail in the written um, report for all of you. Um, this one, I'm just going to spend a couple more minutes on this because this is one of the first projects we started. So this is where we're seeing some first and early success. We did, starting in 2022, again, thanks to early funding from City Council, we, we did a full inventory of signs, historic signs along Route 66. And as a result, um, we really identified some opportunities. We, put some, we partnered with MRA and um, took um, a lot of the money that we had and put it into partnerships with um, business and property owners. And so there are about 20 projects that are underway. Um, and one of them is already completed. So this is one of the Imperial sign, the Imperial Motel sign was one of the revamp Route 66 grant recipients and that project is already completed. And um, the rest of these signs that are listed here, Imperial Inn, Sandia Peak Inn, the Dog House, always a popular one, Arrive Hotel, all of these are, are underway. Most of them already have their signs designed, and so we'll see all of these going up over the next year and a half to two years. Um, I know that you specifically asked about this last week, so um, Community Safety Department, the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, um, has got several initiatives that are really focused on Central Avenue from um, street outreach and coordinating teams to um, a new office along the corridor, engagement with local businesses, and um, outreach and engagement teams. So they've got a pretty significant effort that, they've, that they're standing up um, along Route 66. Um, both MRA and HHH have development projects that are on this Route 66 corridor. These are all projects that are slated to be completed in the next two years. Um, so I'm going to just go because we've got them in a little bit more detail here. Um, there's SOMOS at Central. Um, these are MRA housing developments. The 66 at Adams and Central. Nuevo Atrisco at Central and Unser. The Pearl. Um, Central near Laguna. These are all projects that are underway and expected to be completed. Um, and HHH also has affordable housing projects um, that are going on along the corridor. So four um, projects that we're expecting to see affordable housing um, in the next two years. And then um, we're working on, um, you know, really promoting Route 66 locally, um, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into that because we've got Tanya Armenta here to talk about what they're doing. So she'll do a much better job. And then in terms of next steps, 
Um, we are, um, we've got our community committee coming together. These are really ambassadors and also people who are actively engaged and participating along Route 66. We'll have our master Route 66 events calendar. We believe that um, in terms of all the city signature events, that'll be done um, in terms of choosing dates by uh, May of this year. And then we'll start adding other events from the community as we move through the rest of the year. So by the end of the year, we'll have what we consider to be pretty complete. Um, we're working on a, a website that will be hosted by Visit ABQ. Um, so that it can be there for a while and also so we can push it out to visitors and tourists. Um, we're working on our Albuquerque Neon video series and we're, we continue to engage new partners and look for other funding sources. We have a couple of grants that we'll be writing um, in the next couple months. So in addition to city funding and hopefully partner funding, we'll, we'll hope to bring in some more grant funding as we move forward over the next year and a half. And then we will launch promotions with Visit Albuquerque and others. It is a very fast version of, if you saw the spreadsheet we sent out, of um, about 65. We're trying to get to 66 because we think it's um, poetic. And we are arts and culture. So we're trying to get to 66 distinct initiatives for Route 66 Centennial. Um, and there are additional PDFs and information on the spreadsheet we sent you. So if you want to dive deep into something, you can do that. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions to the best of my ability on all of this this evening. Um, Councillor, would you like for me to go ahead and have uh, Tanya present, or would you like to do questions on um, this part? Mr. President, yeah. If, if we can have Tanya just make a brief presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, presentation B. Mr. President, members of the council, uh, happy to be here this evening and to be partnering with the city of Albuquerque in this important initiative. I am going to move pretty quickly through a promotion to uh, through some slides just to share with you what we've been to doing to date. Of course, promotion of Route 66 is not something new to us in terms of promoting Albuquerque and what uh, visitors are interested in, but we are looking forward to this really uh, monumental opportunity to share Route 66 with both international and domestic visitors as we move forward. So uh, real quickly, I just wanted, because I do know there's some new counselors, just a reminder of who Visit Albuquerque is uh, as a private not-for-profit not organization, of course contracted by the city as the official destination marketing organization. Um, and I wanted to just share our overall mission, of course, is to promote the city as a competitive and world-class leisure convention and meeting and sports destination. And that work does enhance the public image of the city to, as a place to live and work and provides economic opportunity and prosperity for people in our community. So real quickly, uh, this one has really been a fun new initiative. I, I uh, believe you all know from some of our previous work that we've shared, we have wrapped five uh, light rail system, the trains in Denver. That is not just a one. There's a additional advertising in the Denver market, of course, because it's important as a target market. But this was just debuted in February. This is a brand, this is a new train design promoting Route 66. And so you'll see there, celebrating 100 years, we're already starting to promote and build interest in the centennial with um, all of the artwork, of course, reminiscent of things that we're very proud of here in Albuquerque. But this, there is a QR code on this train that takes you to a page on our site that tells you more about Route 66 and more about that experience. Again, it's, uh, it's already been very popular in terms of the, that addition. Um, I don't believe here we'll be able to show you the video, but uh, I do think in your slide presentation you can see that train being wrapped um, in terms of there in Denver. We'll share real quickly, just of course, we produced the Albuquerque official Albuquerque Visitor's Guide. Wanted to share, we uh, print 200,000 of those each, um, each year. And just an example of some of the uh, editorial and photography and, and promotion that we've been using in the uh, Visitor's Guide in terms of Route 66. So those are just some examples. There we go. Uh, through our website, um, in terms of promotion, and as uh, Dr. Sanchez mentioned, we will be uh, expanding and, and building web uh, overall microsite dedicated to the centennial in partnership with the city of Albuquerque. Uh, again, outdoor advertising is something that uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity with some supplemental funding to do more of that in, in the recent, in the last two years. 
This is an example from February to June of this year that we will be showcasing Route 66 featured outdoor boards in Colorado Springs, Denver, Phoenix, El Paso, Dallas, and Los Angeles. Again, this video, I encourage you to look in your presentation, and this is something that we worked on with uh, co-op advertising money from the uh, State Tourism Office and uh, is narrated by Mark Baker from 505 Central in terms of uh, Route 66, and it's playing from a digital advertising standpoint for Albuquerque right now and all of, a lot of our digital advertising buys. Media co coverage, of course, we have a team dedicated to uh, positive publicity on behalf of the city. And so we have already secured some excellent Route 66 coverage in terms of uh, opportunities to come and visit Albuquerque. One that we're very proud of, New Mexico was ranked the number seven travel adventure by National Geographic this year. There was uh, the top 20 coolest travel adventures for 2024 in New Mexico with a really uh, significant focus on Albuquerque. And it was only one of five domestic destinations listed on that. Rate ranking again. Just going to move through some of this, but uh, tremendous media opportunities. And the last thing I wanted to point out is that, of course, we talked about international tourism and domestic tourism. Best uh, one of the best ways to do that is through an opportunity through trade shows. And so we will be. We've already been representing Albuquerque in behalf of some of the consumer and industry um, trade shows, and a really big opportunity with something that's called IPW. The U.S. Travel Association's largest international travel trade show. This year it's in Los Angeles in 2024 and 2025 it's in Chicago. I think it works out perfectly to promote Route 66 uh, on both ends of the, that adventure. So the Great American Road Trip, iconic road trips, is something that our team is working uh, very deliberately and very diligently on in terms of making sure Albuquerque has an opportunity to share its adventure with, with the world. Council, I'm going to recommend if we have questions for you know to reach out to the director and we'll we'll kind of move on to our next item. Thank you all so much. Uh, let's move on to um, to admin Q and A. The council is any discussion with the with the admin. Uh, Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have a couple of questions um, regarding some items I saw in the news um, with, regarding the Gateway asbestos lawsuits. And so, first question is, um, <clears throat> based on the current recent news coverage that I saw, there were three whistleblowers who claim they were retaliated against because they participated in investigations into asbestos. So, I, again, we've talked a lot about not compromising investigations. So I understand if you can't answer that and have to do a closed session around that. Um, but the biggest question I have that I've been getting a lot of calls about is what happened to the employee or employees who made the decision to ignore the asbestos warning? Are they still with the city of Albuquerque? Um, Councilor President, Councilor Rogers, um, I, I really can't get into details of this, um, but I can say we would disagree with that characterization that anyone made a choice to ignore asbestos. I think, you know, the, the administration has said that there were some, some mistakes made. Uh, but I just I wouldn't characterize it that way. We have received that lawsuit. We are reviewing that lawsuit. Um, we generally deny that any retaliatory action was taken against those employees. In fact, we were quite careful when this first uh, arose a year ago to, uh, to protect employees' rights and ensure there was no retaliatory action taken. So we will be defending vigorously these claims. Um, uh, some There were some... Uh, personnel decisions made after, again, a year ago after this first came to light. Uh, and um, I, I don't really think I can get into it, any more details than that. Thank you. The last question then, hopefully you can answer for the people who called me regarding the list of, how did we decide on the list of people who were potentially exposed? Um, how are they notified or how did we identify them? And how can people check to see add themselves to the list. Like, for instance, I've gotten calls from contractors who were in the building during that time that did not get notified. I, as an employee of OEI, was in the building a lot of times during that time, didn't get notified. So how do we add ourselves to that list, or how do public contractors, people who were in the building, how do they add themselves if they feel like they were exposed? So, Council President, Council Rogers, I'm afraid I'm just, I don't fully remember the process that was used to identify who was in the building. I know there was an extensive amount of outreach done to make that determination. There was, there was a, um, a rather extensive list of anyone who had been in the building at any time 
and they were mailed notification uh, of the potential for exposure to asbestos, even though we really don't, you know, don't know the specific dates of exposure. So anyone who had been in the building at any time since the city acquired it. Well, like our congresswoman and our senator. Heinrich, yes, ma'am. <laughs> those people were notified? Yes, they were. Uh, or there were, I mean, I don't know. There was a very extensive list it was, I, of, of people who were notified. We, several members of this body received this, that notice back in May of, of 2023. Um, but so that so but if there were people who believed they were in the building, I don't think that we you know did external outreach I, or I don't know Our how contractors much. at least. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, there, the contractors were notified. I, I I I can guarantee that I have copies of the notices to the subcontractors who work for the general contractor. Not so, just the general. But the employees, each employee. Okay. okay. Um, I know that. So. Um, so but in terms of in, uh, in terms of people adding themselves to the list, people who weren't on that list, because I mean we did our best to right. identify who was in the building. I think we can work out some kind of system that it was, the process was handled by risk management previously. Okay, so currently they should reach out to your office or to risk management. Uh, to risk management. Okay. Councilor Baca, then Councilor Bassan. Uh, Mr. Simon, <laughs> Ms. McRoberts, sorry, I thought we were still talking about that. <laughs> well, th thank you, Mr. Simon, Ms. McRoberts. I appreciate your time coming out here tonight. Um, as you know, I've been receiving a ton of emails and phone calls in regards to the Bosque and the uh, wildfire mitigation project. Um, I want to start by saying I, I fully support that project. You know, I, I, as you both know, I've spent a good chunk of my career working along the middle Rio Grande in, in various capacities. Um, that said, I, I, I do share some of the concerns that some of these folks have. Um, as much as I really care about the Rio, I think the Bosque is what people really care about in our community. Um, so I just, just a couple quick questions. I, I know I sent a bigger list of questions to both of you, but maybe we can publish those later after this. Uh, but one, I just, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the clearings at right along Tingley Beach, some of the ver very first parts were very, very visible to visitors. Um, there's a lot of concerns about that. Um, I also traveled down there and I saw that outside of that, especially closer to the Hispanic Cultural Center, it looks like it's a lot more, a lot more care was taken in, in what, was, what was done. So I just want to, A, uh, make sure that, you know, from your, from your words, that to ensure that that, that practice of a bit more careful is going to continue. And then B, the, the big part is, is replanting and reseeding. Um, you know, it's with, with the way the Bosque has changed and, and climate change and the loss of the hydrograph, which is real, it's, you know, a, a lot of that native vegetation doesn't, doesn't stick the way it used to. And so um, I think this is an opportunity for folks to uh, not only hear from you what, what the plan is in a little bit more detail, but uh, also ways for them to, to engage and participate in bringing back our Bosque. Great. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, Councillor Baca, thank you so much for your interest in this topic, your deep knowledge of the subject, and, and of course the, the Council's overall interest and support for the Open Space Program. We really appreciate that. As you, as you many people know, the, the City uh, Parks Department through the Open Space Division, we manage the Rio Grande Valley State Park uh, through a joint powers agreement with the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Uh, and through the Rio Grande Valley State Park Act. So it's a, it's a complicated um, multi-jurisdictional partnership approach to managing the Bosque. Uh, managing the Bosque. Um, we were very successful in obtaining a, a FEMA grant through partnership between Albuquerque Fire and Rescue and Parks and Rec Open Space. We obtained this large, nearly $1 million FEMA grant to support a wildfire uh, mitigation project to reduce the severity of catastrophic wildfire, a wildfire and a support overall ecosystem health, forest health, and uh, significantly try to protect the major infrastructure that is along the Bosque, particularly in this area, uh, sensitive and highly used and popular area of the Bosque that includes the Biopark and the National Hispanic uh, Cultural Center. I want to also thank the Council for your support of the project since uh, 
it was through the approval of council resolution that we were able to move forward on the project and also a contract with uh, Ciudad Soil and Water Conservation District, one of our partners in the project. So I have with me today to help answer the, a couple of your questions, um, Colleen Lang and McRoberts, who's our open space superintendent. I'll try to address the, the first question you had, uh, Councillor, about uh, what we call the prescription in the Bosque, or it's sort of the the guidelines for conducting a forest thinning and fuel reduction project of this nature. So we've completed about 70% of the project. Uh, we, we started uh, in two areas. There's 14 different units, really, for this fuel uh, thinning project. Two of the units we started with, one is close to Tingley Beach, the other close to the um, National Hispanic Cultural Center. And uh, th those were among the first units to be treated. So we were literally testing the prescription as we went. And as we saw that on the ground, we were able to then adjust our prescription. So uh, what you see sort of in these couple of units that were treated first in the project uh, is uh, not what you'll see you know, in the other 12 uh, units. Overall, there was uh, this is about a 470 acre project area. But within that 470 acres, <coughs> we're only actually treating about 190 acres or about 40% or so. So, um, you know, we're trying to be careful about how we go about that. I think in one of the areas that uh, you may have uh, noticed, um, you know, we did take out some, some large trees, Siberian elms, which are non-native species, obviously, and that was noticeable, particularly along the, 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 the bicycle trail near Tingley Beach, whenever you see a large tree come down. You know, one of the reasons, of course, that occurred was, again, fire protection. But um, m most of you know, if you have a, uh, an elm, a Siberian elm in your yard or in your neighbor's yard, uh, they're quite prolific seed producers. Uh, that and cottonwoods produce these storms you know, of seeds in the early summer. So when we, when we took out, made the decision to take out some of those larger trees, it's really because we don't want to have the area reseeded again with non-native Siberian elms. Um, but we've adjusted our prescription in the other units, so we're preserving a few more like stems, you know, uh, trees, mostly native species in those areas. So uh, th that's why units, unit five and one of the other units looks a little bit different. But we've adapted, we're moving forward with as sensitive a prescription as we can in the other units. Um, with the focus, again, on reducing and eliminating non-native species as they tend to make the bosque more fire prone. And of course, a major disturbance such as a wildfire is a very, very bad thing for wildlife uh, habitat also in the bosque. A major disturbance like that sets the bosque back and it's almost impossible to recover except over a long period of time to recover the native species. So, uh, and recovery really in restoration is uh, the goal in addition to the wildfire uh, threat reduction, and to talk about the plans for restoration, I, I'd like to have uh, Superintendent Lagan address that for you. So, Mr. Baca, this is, or Councilor Baca, mm -hmm. this is fine. I know the Councilor has other mm -hmm. questions. We've mm -hmm. already had about an hour of presentations mm -hmm. tonight, and this has already turned into about another 10-minute presentation. I mean, do you have some so specific questions? I think we just questions? had one question, which we can address is the restoration okay. question. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. President and Councilors. Thank you for the opportunity to just provide some additional context. I'll make it brief. Um, I do want to explain that at this point, we only have about two more weeks max while we're just doing the rest of the tree felling. And then the work that you're going to see is uh, just removing the downed wood and the mulch. And that will be completed before the migratory bird nesting season. That's been one of the reasons we've been um, speeding up this project is to meet the grant deadline, as well as the migratory bird nesting season to limit our impact. We've been working with four crews doing this work simultaneously, so I know it's been a lot all at once. Um, our next phase is going to be developing a short and long-term restoration action plan. The short-term plan is already completed pretty much, and that is looking at a six-month time frame from February to August. And then the long-term plan will be more of a two-year time frame. So during that short-term plan, we'll be doing things like closing off uh, social trails that were created from the equipment, getting our ancestral lands crew out there to reestablish the trails. We'll be doing a number of plantings, um, you know, some pole plantings where we're close to the water table, utilizing some tall pots, um, 
looking at how to incorporate oyas for water availability for more drought resistant species on the higher slopes. And, um, and then we're working with a great group of people to develop a long-term plan, a committee that will help to provide input, including the Bird Alliance, the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, Interstate Stream Commission. Many partners are at the table with us in developing the long-term plan. We'll be making those available to the public on the website that we have for the current project. And there's going to be plenty of volunteer opportunities We've already been employing volunteers during this regular time. We do pole plantings. We have a couple of projects in this area um, with youth crews and community members. Um, in addition to that, we'll have some big events coming up, one in May that's going to be more education focused, followed by a one later in May for our National River Cleanup. So lots of opportunities for the, for the public to learn more and to volunteer, and um, we'll make all of that information available to the public. Thank you. You send all that to me so I can share it out. And uh, the other questions I had lined up, I can I can share those out later. So I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the the time, Mr. President. I think the uh, the Bosque is one of those jewels, unique jewels that we have here in in Albuquerque. I mean, it's I think people don't realize just how different it is to have a living river running through your city, whereas most cities just have canals running through. So thank you for your it time. Is, it is it. changing. So we're oh, yeah. trying to change with it. But uh, Council Brasad, thank you very much. Councilor Champagne. Uh, Mr. President, my question is for the administration on some other topic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, a couple weeks ago, I wasn't present in person, and I meant to ask this question, and then I want to make sure to circle back. What makes our country so great is our ability to have freedom of speech. What makes Albuquerque so beautiful is the diversity of culture and opinions. What is the administration doing and what is, is there a plan uh, so that when there are protests, protesters are not necessarily allowed to get right next to other people who might be going about something completely irrelevant to what, what the topic of the protest may be. Um, you know, a few years ago there was the whole Onyate statue, and then we've had some recent things happening with some heated protests in Albuquerque. And I just want to know what, this, what the administration's take is on making sure that, you know, while we can have this diversity and, and the privilege and the right that we have with the Constitution, that we're also making sure that there's not that overstep. And, and so I'd love to hear what we're, what we're doing to be proactive about that. Uh, Council President and Councillor Bassan, thank you for the question. Um, and, you know, I know for... Um, I know for that we've recently had several instance, instances in which we've had um, folks interested in protesting at uh, large public events. Um, the convention center oftentimes becomes a place where folks uh, want to do so. And I know that when we recently had a very large event at the convention center, expecting you know more than a thousand people at the event, we um, worked to put in place a plan that was related to, to ensure that individuals had the right and the place to, to protest and to be heard and to ensure that folks felt safe as they entered the building. I think that was um, well planned between Metro Security, APD, um, uh, private security, and, uh, and other entities that would be related, or I'm sorry, um, out located within the jurisdiction as well. Um, and I think it was it was coordinated well. What I can't tell you is exactly how that plan was la uh, planned out, but I'd be happy to bring that back and share that with you, so that we can speak to the detail that went into that. Um, I think it was done as uh, well in the most recent time I was there, and and I know that in preparation of that event, we had um, uh, multiple meetings to coordinate and ensure that we were providing the location on Civic Plaza for protest and to allow people to access. Um, and I think it was actually in response to a previous arrangement not being as well planned. And so I think we can bring to you what our, our current strategy is. Mr. President, and thank you. And, you know, I don't need to know the specific ins and outs. I just definitely think that it's important for people to know that they absolutely can protest, they can express their right to freedom of speech, but they should not do it necessarily if we can make sure to help out where possible at city events or large gatherings that the city knows within arm's reach of one another. I don't think that that's going to be a recipe for success for anyone. Um, so I am glad to hear that the administration does do something to make sure that, that we can try it our best to accommodate both sides of the spectrum on that. But 
arm's reach seems to be a recipe for disaster when it comes to, to something like that. Absolutely. Um, Council President and Councillor Bassan, I think it's also just important to know that we're always monitoring the situation to ensure that at any time we understand when folks want to, are planning to um, exercise their right to protest so that we can support both the safety of the protesters and the individuals that they may be uh, nearby or adjacent to. And so I do see the, the ongoing monitoring to ensure that we're doing that support as well. Councilor Champagne and Councilor Grubb. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a couple questions for the administration. Uh, as a new councillor, I'm trying to stay in communication with my constituents. So uh, I'm able to grab a couple of questions each week or during the between meetings and ask them that are asked of me. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, we might be all over the spectrum on this one. So uh, the turf at Gladiator Stadium, um, it was in it was paid for by our taxpayers' money and installed in Rio Rancho or city money installed in Rio Rancho. And I believe that it's been returned back to the city. Uh, somebody's asking about where the where it is now and what it's being used for. Council, Council President, uh, Council Champagne, um, that turf has been returned back to Albuquerque. It is currently at Expo New Mexico. Um, installed, it it gets put down. It gets taken up. Um, even at Rio Rancho, it was put down for events and, and, and pulled up for events. So it's not installed like a carpet. I just want to make that clear. But it has been returned um, to Albuquerque. It's at Expo New Mexico awaiting, um, you know, a new season of the Gladiators. So it will be returned back to Rio Rancho then? Uh, uh, Council President and Councilor Champagne, no. We expect uh, Expo New Mexico and the Gladiators to work out an agreement for the Gladiators to practice back at Expo, New, or to play at Expo New Mexico, which was the original intent of that. But the pandemic had, the pandemic and, and some um, construction uh, going on at Tingley made it impossible for them to play there. So that's when we, um, that's why it ended up in Rio Rancho. Oh, okay. Um, question two, Mr. President, uh, the, the asbestos, Gateway Center story. Um, what has, and maybe you can't answer this because it has to do with legalities as far as what our exposure is, and it's a little too early to, to know exactly, but uh, as far as the lawsuits, what our exposure is as the city, but what, how is the progress going with the actual cleanup now that we have the, the right team in there to do it? Mr. President, um, Councillor Champagne, sorry, I just checked to make sure I was allowed to answer before no, I answered. No, I know. It's <laughs> um, a delicate ballet. So uh, since this, um, we have developed a absolute protocol within the city to ensure that any time any project is going to touch a building that is of a certain age or um, would potentially have um, an, uh, any potential for asbestos, we um, have a protocol that includes now our director of DMD, um, uh, Jennifer Turner's in, engagement, and we do have a, we follow that protocol. So each one of the projects within the Gibson Health Hub or the Gateway um, has that protocol engaged for cleanup related to asbestos or any other um, matter that we would need to be considering in each project. So as we start a project to, for construction or renovation, the asbestos issues related to that, the assessment That's and sick. the cleanup happens with each one of those package uh, of those. So we do not go into any area of the building and disturb that part of the building without doing an assessment in advance to ensure that we are not putting anyone in any exposure. We use a contractor to do that work um, that is essentially a certified asbestos assessment. Um, there are a couple companies in town. We, we use whichever one is appropriate or available, to be honest, um, to ensure that we meet those requirements and do that on each project. Okay. Um, and only two more questions. I promise to be quick. I apologize. Uh, the current DWI investigation, uh, what's the likelihood of that extending? Does the administration know the likelihood of that extending the DOJ's presence any longer than, I mean, we're talking about the paragraphs and how close we were at a percentage rate, and then has it dropped it from 94 to 82 or whatever it may be? Um, Councilor President, Council Champagne, we, we do not expect the DWI investigation to affect the length of the CASA. We are, um, I think as you know, we hit 94% compliance in um, the fall. 
Uh, we, we expect a similar rating in the spring. Uh, we have had discussions with DOJ about how to wrap up and end this process, and they have not indicated, or they have actually indicated that the DWI investigation, they do not expect it to affect that timeline in any way. Okay. Uh, and last question, this I think is more directed toward the police department, uh, if I could. Um, I think they do the criteria of, of what I'm going to if ask. You don't, if you don't mind asking, if we know which one, I, I guess Mike's coming down. Mike, Mike will probably know. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start it because I'm on, you can hear me as I'm coming up to save time, but uh, just out of curiosity, uh, SIG alerts, that's a significant event that's emailed out. Um, is there a criteria to, that you know of that determines this is enough? Uh, and, and I'll tell you all the details of what it is, and this is more of mine. Uh, during last month, I received 478 SIG alerts. Um, during which I read, I started trying to keep up with them and read them uh, and paying attention to the ones involved in my district, but then reading the notes, it's, it's you know, subject was stopped and uh, found to have a warrant or, you know, arrested without incident, and that's a SIG alert that I get. Um, out of 470 emails, what's the criteria that these are being sent out? Yeah. Council President, uh, Councilor Champagne, uh, there is amount, significant amount of uh, SIG alerts that do go out. They're for felony arrest that we have. A lot of them also play into part into some investigations and then, of course, some operations. Like currently, we have an operation with a warrant backlog. So I have instructed to have any felony warrant arrest to be documented so I can keep track of all of those individuals on the, that we're arresting on a daily basis. So it's more of a tracking purposes. Um, but yes, they are significant and they do okay. take a long time. As you know, years ago, um, we had about the same amount. You know, when we started making a large push for a lot of arrest, we wanted to document those because a lot of times that communications between divisions, if the field arrests someone and they advise, they find out that there's officers, field officers that arrested their target. So now they're in communications of, okay, now I need to interview them, what information, that sort of thing. So it's a lot of, uh, has to do with a lot of communication throughout the divisions and officers. Okay. Okay, yeah, like I said, when just reading the details, I'm like, without significant. I, I read them like, too, so there's a lot. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Grout, I'm gonna go on to the, on to the journal. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a couple of questions um, for the administration. Um, how many vacancies do we have um, you know, city's always looking for employees. How many vacancies do we have throughout the city? Mr. President, Councillor Grout, um, I don't know the answer to that. We have a significant number of vacancies um, in the city right now um, in the hundreds. Okay. Do we use a staffing company? Uh, Mr. President, us. Councilor uh, Grout, we do use um, the support from staffing companies as well as recruiters when, when necessary, when we're having significant issues. We also use other strategies for recruitment and work with our partners throughout the city, um, actually without the, throughout the region, to work to hold hiring events. Thank you. Um, when was the last time we did have a, a staffing company on contract to help us find? Um, Council President, uh, Councillor Grout, um, Kevin, our CFO, just um, uh, insured, answered for me. Thank you. But we do have um, uh, staffing agencies on contract now. We do? Okay, good. Because I, um, I was um, asking around, because we do have a lot of vacancies. And like you said, they're in the hundreds. And um, sometimes it, it seems like a, it takes a long time to get a lot of things done. And the excuse I hear often is, we don't have enough staff. So um, I'm wondering, I know that staffing companies are successful in finding recruiting for us. And in years past, we have had people on staff, or you know, on, on contract. And I'd really like to encourage us to look at that again, because we need to get, I don't like hearing the excuse, well, I don't have, we're not staffed enough. I don't think that's a good excuse. So I would encourage you all to do that. And the, the, my next couple of questions 
They have to do with Los Altos Park. I've had a lot of people reach out and ask, when can we use Los Altos Park again? It's always closed. So can you answer that for me? Uh, Count, uh, Mr. President, Councillor uh, Grout, I'd like to invite Dave Simon to come up. I think he can give you all the exact information about Los Altos. Mm -hmm. I could re paraphrase, but he will be exact for yes. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Grout, we're very excited to be looking toward the sort of reopening of Los Altos Park here in March. You know, it'll be, commence the standard softball season, uh, which begins in March with the spring league. So. Right now, we've been allowing the field and the park mostly to rest and set, grow in, and, and protect that big investment we have made. And once we move back into full softball season, the park is going to be open a lot more. Um, so we're very excited about the Thank you. year coming. Um, meaning that people can just go by and find a tree and sit underneath Yeah, it? when the park is open, the park will be you yeah. know, fully open. We're, of course, okay. we're going to manage Los Salatos Park, Councilor, differently than it used to be. We okay. want to make sure we protect our investment there. So we will have periods of time when the park will be open and periods of time when it can be closed. And that is a great benefit to us um, when we can say uh, when the park is open, come on in, and when it's closed, we would prefer you use another park. Yes. Uh, but we'll be you know, moving forward with a very, very busy season starting uh, just as soon as softball resumes here in a Thank few you. short weeks. Thank you. I know a lot of people will be excited about that. Um, then my final couple questions have to do with the tournaments that are at um, the, the park. I understand that there are softball or softball and baseball tournaments, and I, I don't know, you know, all of that. But um, there are fees that are are um, associated with these tournaments. So my question is, the fees that are um, that are incurred do. Does, does that income go into the general fund, or does it go back into the parks fund? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Grout, uh, Los Altos Park is principally a softball okay. facility, not a baseball facility. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another great facility for that, uh, which is out on the, on the west side. Um, the fees that uh, accompany tournament use of the park would return to the general fund. Is there a, a, thank you. Is there a reason why it goes into the general fund and not back into parks? It's, uh, Kevin, you wanna take that one or it's more common practice? Yes, uh, Council President and Councilor Grout, um, as you know, we come before you every year for appropriations. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be appropriated, so whether it went into parks or whether it went back to general fund, we come back to you for every penny of revenue. Everything that we bring in, we come back to you for an appropriation to expend. So it's really six of one or half a dozen of another. That money goes into the general fund and it, we request appropriations back okay. out. So thank you. So thank you. <clears throat> and for, so that follow up um, to that then, um, might have to explain it a little bit to me. Um, so with that analogy that, are, that you just shared, when um, we get fees from planning for, for permitting and so forth, does that go into the general fund too, or does it go back into the planning department? Uh, Council President, Councilor Grout, um, you will see during our budget process this year um, that that money does go to the general fund, okay. and then we ask for it to be reappropriated. And we, we educate Council, we're happy to educate council. We educate our directors all the time. Just because you're bringing revenue in doesn't mean that you can spend it. We have to bring it back to this body okay. to appropriate it. So do we, do we track the funds that, go, that are being um, brought in, that income brought in from parks? Is that all light, light items? Council President, Councilor Grout, absolutely. Okay. We have revenue accounts. We track revenue. We have expenditure accounts. We uh, track expenditures. And we've got a fair amount of detail. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you all. Council Sanchez, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. President. It's a follow-up question to Councilor John Pine's um, gladiator question. Um, the questions, it's real quick. It, um, who determines which team uses the, uh, the gladiator turf or the turf? I don't think it's a, just one person, right? It's a city's turf, so multiple people should be able to use it, correct? Uh, Council President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, 
Yes, that was uh, part of the agreement originally as well with Rio Rancho that they had to allow um, others to be able to use the, the turf. And that is our arrangement with Expo New Mexico. There are, um, they do have to make that turf available. And if someone uh, wants to use that turf, they would make arrangements with um, Expo New Mexico to set up and use that turf on site. The reason I was asking is I saw some pictures, um, photos this weekend in reference to the New Mexico runners soccer team, and it didn't look like a new turf that they were using. So if you can check with that and make sure that it's being utilized properly, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. I will go to the journal, Council Grout. I move approval of the journal. Uh, there's a motion and a second by Councilor Bassan. Those, those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Item six is communication and introductions. Uh, any changes to the letter of introduction? I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC66 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC66 approval of the risk second the risk second supplemental agreement to add funds for outside council legal services between Holland and Hart uh, LLP and the city of Albuquerque. Need two thirds votes. So. Uh, Second. Then motion and seconded by Councilor Grout. Any discussion? Uh, those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC71 on, on tonight's agenda for final action. EC71 is the mayor's appointment of Mr. Brian C. Patterson at the Impact Fee Committee. Uh, then a motion been seconded by Councilor Brisson. Uh, those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, Councilor Sanchez. Move that tonight's rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R23 on tonight's agenda for action. R23 is amending the official list of city council meetings from January 2024 through December 2024. Second. Moved and seconded by Councilor Grout. Councilor, any discussion? Uh, the motion is made and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those, those opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R24 on tonight's agenda for action. R24 is directing the city administration to request a multi-agency investigation into the February 17, 2024 incident involving Chief Police Harold Medina. That's been moved and seconded by Councilor Champagne. Councilors, any, any questions, discussion? Uh, those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion passed. All right. Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. Second. The motion is seconded by Councillor uh, Rogers, uh, and uh, so the approval of the letter. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, we're going to go to uh, no reports of committees. We'll go to deferrals and withdrawals. Councillors, any, any deferrals or withdraw withdrawals at this time? Uh, there are none. We're going to go on to the consent agenda. Any changes to the consent agenda? Uh, so for the individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on a board or commission, we want to thank you for your willingness to serve. So thank Mr. you, Councilor Grout. Mr. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. The motion and seconded by Councilor Champagne. Uh, in discussion, question, those, are, those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. We go to announcements. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, there will be an Intergovernmental legislati Legislative Relations Committee meeting on Wednesday, March 6th at 3 p.m. via Zoom video conference. And there will be a Committee on Guidelines for Negotiations meeting on Thursday, March 7th at 9 a.m. via Zoom video conference. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, March 11th at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. All right, back to Councilor Bassan. Mr. Already... President, there will be a Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting on Wednesday, March 13th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. Basement level of the Albuquerque Government Center. This will be a hybrid meeting, and if you didn't know, that's in this room. All right, thank you. We uh, Financial instruments, there's no report tonight. Uh, item 11 is appeals. Item A is AC 2320. This is the Albuquerque Land Use Consulting LLC. Carl Garcia, agent for Lance Kilgore, appeals the Environmental Planning Commission. Decision to deny is a zoning map amendment from R1D to, to MXT for all the portion of Lot 27, Lot 3, Unit 13. I'm not going to read the rest of that. Ms. Uh, Ron, Ron Kia, would you like to start? Thank you, Mr. President. The issue in this appeal is whether a zone change from R1D, which is residential, to MXT, which is mixed-use transition, 
to be approved for a 1.6 acre site located at Rainbow Boulevard Northwest and Rosa Parks Road Northwest. The EPC denied the request for a zone change, finding that the requested MXT's, MXT zone's purpose of serving as a transition between residential and commercial uses makes it an inappropriate zone in this area comprised of only residential zones and that the MXT zone would create an unjustified spot zone that does not reinforce or facilitate implementation of the comp plan. Uh, the property owners appealed the EPC's denial and this was referred to the land use hearing officer who recommends that the council deny the appeal and uphold the EPC's decision to deny the zone change. The LUHO specifically found that the area is comprised of residential zones, R1D and RML, so introducing the requested MXT zone as a transition is inappropriate because MXT is intended to function as a transition between residential zones and more intense uh, commercial areas. Here, there are no more intense commercial areas because the existing zone districts in the area are all residential. Um, in fact, the MXT zone itself would introduce more intense uses, which would contravene the purpose of a transition zone, which is to protect residential uh, zones from more intense uses. The LUHO also agreed that the requested MXT zone would create an unjustified spot zone in a designated area of consistency. The MXT zone is incompatible with the area which is intended for predominantly large lot single family residential uses. Uh, the LUHO found the EPC appropriately denied the zone change and recommends that the council deny the appeal and uphold the EPC's decision. And this is an accept or reject proceeding tonight, so we won't hear from any of the parties, but I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Um, as a reminder, your options tonight are to accept the LUHO's recommendation and findings, accept the recommendation but adopt different findings, or reject the LUHO recommendation and findings, in which case the council will hold a full hearing on this matter at our next meeting. All right, counselors, um, uh, any um, uh, questions for our staff or discussion or recommendations? Council Bassan. Mr. President, I would like to uh, make a motion to accept the LUHO recommendation and findings. Second. Uh, so that's been moved and seconded by uh, Council Bassan, uh, seconded by Councilor Grout. I guess one question, um, are we, um, is it in the record, I wasn't sure if it's clearly in the record as far as uh, the intended use, uh, specific use of the property? Uh, the, Mr. President, the applicants uh, testify or um, in the record um, noted that they intend to put a wireless telecommunications facility on the site. However, um, just as a reminder, when the zone change um, is applied to a parcel, they, that opens up all of the land uses that are um, available for that zone. Um, so even if they um, intend to do one thing, that um, doesn't mean that they're prohibited from the other uses that would be available to them in that zone. In, in your understanding, the applicants had, uh, you know, plenty of opportunity during the EPC meetings to explain their their uh, their application and much discussion with the EPC regarding that. Uh, Mr. President, that's correct. There was no allegation that they were um, stifled in their discussion with the EPC or that they didn't have an opportunity to go through that discussion at that stage. Right. I mean, and my tendency would be to you know maybe recommend a, a full hearing on this, but I think because of that, I think the parties had plenty of opportunity to be able to explain their case and uh, much deliberation of the uh, EPC. Um, you know, I think I'll um, you know, agree with the recommendation. So, counselors, any other uh, discussion or any other recommendations? All right, the, uh, the, the motion to accept the LUHO recommendation is finding, and findings has been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Uh, that motion passed. We're going to go down to general public comments. Members of the public can provide live public comments to the council in person or virtually if they've signed up for public comment for the instructions published on the agenda on our website on Fridays. Uh, here's the public comment ground rules. Each participant has two minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the councilors only uh, through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the meeting. Uh, there's a two-minute time limit. Bell's going to ring to indicate your time is up. Mr. Cornelius, if you call the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Francesco Artist, followed by Tyler Richter. Thank you for the Black History Month and the uh, Flamingo Dancer presentation. Really great energy in the room. Maybe to keep the party going, 
you all could start giving cold hard cash to the people sitting in the audience, like the Water Authority. It would be a great way to publicly recognize great people who work for the city who go above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, if I can please get the overhead. Thank you, sir. Speaking of above and beyond, while we're standing in this chamber, we can't talk about Albuquerque. We can't talk about black history and not say the word Nicole Rogers. It is such an honor to be standing before this city council, the first in American history of our beautiful city to have to have the first African-American woman to be elected to city council, the governing body of Albuquerque. It is a pleasure to stand before you, Councilor Rogers, and to say thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you. Mr. President. Yes, opinion. Just once again, I just want to thank you for this. This is a beautiful picture of um, Councillor Rogers, but then again, you had given us this, this Route 66. You're just such a phenomenal artist, so thank you again, Francesco. Yeah, really, really great work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Tyler Richter, followed by Antoinette Suina. Evening, councilors. Uh, my name is Tyler Richter. I am here as a resident of District 7 in the Pueblo Alto neighborhood. Um, I serve my community in a couple of ways. I'm the president of the Pueblo Alto Neighborhood Association. I'm also the co-chair of our Southeast Policing Council, um, Community Policing Council. Um, tonight, I'm here to speak in favor of Bill 024-1. I guess the order got messed up. Some of my neighbors are going to speak to you uh, more specifically about uh, one home in a neighborhood that has uh, been a nuisance property. Um, I believe that o the bill 024-1 will allow um, the residents of Albuquerque to um, aid in the, uh, the, the, the moving of nuisance properties from nuisance properties to for sale lots. Um, Let's see. As the president of Pueblo Alto and, uh, and my neighborhood, I currently have a uh, uninhabited home across the street from my house. It's been uninhabited for 20 years. There's been much, much uh, outreach to the homeowners and the banks that own the home. Um, it is currently attracting um, uh, un, uh, unhoused uh, attentions, and it's recently been tagged by the city of Albuquerque. But for homes to take 20 years to be demolished and, and taken um, out of a nuisance situation is entirely too long. And so I speak in favor of Bill 024-1. Thank you. Antoinette Suina, followed by Ariana Suina. I'm shorter, so I thought that. Um, thank you for allowing us to be here today to speak. Um, my daughter and I are here today because we want to bring to your attention an accident caused by an APD officer on April 17, 2017. We were making a left-hand turn through the intersection when he T-boned the back of my car where my kids were seated. This was during quitting time traffic as the officer traveled 80 miles an hour in a 40-mile zone killing my six-year-old son and critically injuring my daughter, who was nine at the time. She stands here with me today. We spent that month in the hospital as she laid fractured from head to toe with a traumatic brain injury. The officer who hit us had six prior accidents, ours being his seventh. 
Not only was he called off the call, but he chose to dispatch himself out to the call, to a call that was already resolved. In light of the latest car crash incident, it is concerning whether the driving simulator that we donated to the city of Albuquerque and APD is even being utilized for training and what measures APD are putting in place once again to prevent these types of accidents from continuing to happen. It's deeply troubling that those in elected positions praise such actions as it disregards potential loss of innocent lives through reckless choices. First responders and especially those in leadership roles must be held at a higher standard and, need, and should be held accountable for their actions, not rewarded for neglected, neglectful behavior. The recent crash that with the police chief reflects a lack of regard for public safety as he had no due regard for the public at large. My son, Anthony, would have been 13 years old this year. Instead of celebrating milestones and attending school activities and his sports games, we stand here to be his voice to see change. My daughter would also like to speak. Ariana Suina, followed by Sue Flint. Um, hello, and thank you for having me here this evening. My name is Ariana. I'm 16 years old and the older sister of Anthony, who at such a young age was robbed of his life due to the hands of a reckless driver. Not only was the life of my little brother taken, but I was also left in critical condition. My question is how many innocent lives need to be taken and how many more critical conditions need to be seen due to the recklessness and carelessness of those who have the role to serve and protect. While accidents do happen, accountability must be upheld, which is something that some of our officers who have been at fault lack. When these accidents are caused by officers who are breaking protocol, carelessly causing accidents that could easily be prevented, they need to be held at a higher responsibility for the role that they play. As a new driver, I shouldn't have to be troubled by the thought of being harmed by one of our officers while being on the road. When we think of the title police officer, we are supposed to have a sense of reassurance that they're going to keep us safe. I'm here today to shed light on the fact that many of these types of accidents are reoccurring and need to stop. When something isn't working, change should take place. When officers make the decision to take their role, they are held at a higher standard because they are taking the role to be one of our leaders. But who's leading them? When they don't have a person in command who is leading by good example, that's when protocols get broken and these types of tragic incidents happen. From our accident, we wanted to help stop things like this happening by donating a driving simulator, which is supposed to help police officers prevent accidents like this. What's the point of having all these trainings and precautions if they aren't being utilized or taken seriously? My brother's death will not be in vain, and these types of fatalities should be the reason why our officers want to do better. I hope that change will happen so that another family doesn't have to suffer from the detrimental actions of these officers. Thank you. We're, we're so sorry for your loss and, and all that your family has experienced and been through, and thank you so much for coming here tonight and for talking. Councillor Sanchez, I think, has comments. Thank you, ma'am, for coming here. This really touched all of us. I, I'm so sorry for your loss, and I'm so sorry for that you have to deal with all your injuries, and thank you so much for coming here and, and sharing um, this devastation that you have been going through. I, it just breaks my heart. Um, the question that I have for the administration is, is this um, driving simulator being utilized every single day by the officers of the police department? Um, it sounds to me, and I'm, you can just make sure that I'm right on this, it sounds to me that there was probably a lawsuit. You used that lawsuit money, returned that money to help law enforcement officers <laughs> not be involved in a situation like this. Um, and here we are in another one. Um, I just need to know um, if everyone is using that simulator, and I would also like to know if our chief was using, has used that simulator and when. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Councilor Sanchez, so I'm aware that we have the simulator, and I will get you an answer to that as far as if it's 
in through training. I know we do what's called mandatory training referrals for anything that's outside of, you know, if there's an accident or because there's a, a crash review board that happens and the results of those crash review boards, officers are mandated to go to training. Um, but I'll get you a definitive answer. And again, I'm sorry for you. Thank you. Mr. President, so am I understanding that it's only being used during um, referrals, crash referrals? No, sir. Like I said, it's at the academy. And so where it's at, so I'm not sure how it's being utilized. I'm not, I don't oversee the academy and training, but I'll get you those answers. Thank you. If you can have those for us um, ASAP, if you could send them to my email, sure. I'd really appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Council Rogers. Uh, in that information, Deputy Commander, before you go, could we also get a, the most recent crash review board reports of how much this is happening in APD? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Would you like the total amount of crashes involved in APD personnel? Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you all again. Thank you. Appreciate you coming thank down. Thank you. Up next, we have Sue Flint, followed by Janice Herrera. Evening. May I have the viewer, please? The view. Thank you. As I said last time, my name is Sue Flint. I live in a community called Sun North Estates. We're a manufacturer, home community of real property, homeowner owned, single family. And I'm here tonight, of course. I'm not for NAOP, so that's my main objective. But back years ago, I sent an email to then Senator Tim Keller, and it was about uh, the city coming in and violating our deeds that had covenants. And he sent me an email telling me that the state of New Mexico cannot legally declare those contracts, i.e., your deeds and covenants, no, or change them. However, that's exactly what they did. And, you know, it's all public records. This right here is the R09263 that Debbie O'Malley had. CAO then, David Campbell, submitted the wrong comprehensive zoning code, SU1-MH Park, into this to the city planner, Chris Heyer. We are not a mobile home park. We've never been a mobile home park. We're an SU1-MH Park. It's not us. We're in SU-1. And so this here is the map of Ron Bohannon that was used in the R-1111. And he's about the only person with Jim Strozier who used that R-09263 on mobile home parks and communities as mine. Now, you passed his R-043. And that was what I spoke about last time, which was against the Dillon rule. And it is not the home rule that you should use because there's a distinction between property taxes and personal taxes, and that's why the state of New Mexico recognizes it. Thank you. And thank you for not yelling at me last time for talking over. Janice Herrera, followed, followed by Anami Das. Good evening, Council President Lewis and members of the Council. Tonight I'm here to speak with you as a health promotion specialist at the Health Equity Council in service of public health and equitable outcomes in Bernalillo County. At HEC, I work under the Public Health Initiative grant for which our contract with the Health, Housing, and Homelessness Department includes some upcoming deliverables. Since there are some relatively new members on the council, welcome again. I would like to offer you a preview of what to expect. Each quarter, PHI staff at HEC prepare at least three one-page policy papers focusing on per current public health issues that intersect with equity, including recommendations for programs and interventions for your review. This quarter, our team have compiled four policy one-pagers as follows. Health and access to public restrooms, a path to cleaner water, syphilis in Bernalillo County, and urban pharmacy desert, the international district. I hope that each of you find the analysis helpful when these reach your desks. We are also currently updating the community health profile for 2024, a data summary that reflects the health of our community using the latest information from epidemiology. I would like to praise my colleagues at HEC for their dedication and lens for equity. 
I also want to give kudos to city staff who lent support and expertise, especially around ArcGIS mapping. This includes Tiber Casuse Giovinto and Maria Gallegos from the Environmental Health Department. My heartfelt thanks to ArcGIS expert and HEC volunteer Michael Petula on loan from SWCA Environmental Consultants. Finally, also a shout out to my counselor, Joaquin Baca, and Councilwoman Nicole Rogers. Thanks for coming to Transit Equity Day at the Alvarado Transit Center. I hope to see more of you all at community events soon. Uh, I do appreciate your time this evening and wish you all a good night. Thanks. Anami Das, followed by Tad Nieminski. Anami Das, followed by Tad Nieminski. Thank you. My name is Ted Nieminski. I have a hard time to hear myself without. Anyway, Route 66, history. Route 66, I remember 69, start at in Albuquerque, start at Tramway Road. That was road, dirt road up and down. No housing until you get to Eubank. So anyway, what about now? Of course, through downtown. Uh, historic. Rest of it is basically gone. Oh, except thanks to the city. Now, let me move on. From Tremay, going to, going to Wyoming. Reminds me now, another building uh, tagged by New Center base basement. We find finds every day Find fifteen hundred five hundred dollar. So, so where is uh, what about neighborhood? Where is neighborhood? City clean up downtown area and other areas. Look at Trumbo neighborhood south between San Pedro and Wyoming. All these alleys and nearby streets. Where is the, this who protects and serve? Where they are, council robbers? Maybe we can meet, I would like to meet for half hour uh, this week, this coming week. Then take a tour. Thank you. Anami Das, followed by John Major. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name's Anami. I'm the chair of the Human Rights Board. Um, I wanted to present a copy of R-24-1, the homeless rights resolution that the board passed at our last meeting. However, I saw Gil in the hallway, and I got excited, and I handed him my only copy. Um, so I would encourage all of y'all to look at that resolution. Uh, it's on cabq.gov. And uh, yeah. I think that's it. Cool. Thanks. John Major, followed by Rudolph Serrano. Mr. President, Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank each of you for your service. More important than you may realize. I came here to express a concern over the conduct of the investigation into Chief Medina immediately preceding and including his crash on February 17th, I believe. Although it's hard to imagine a more compelling argument or call for police accountability than what we just heard. Repeat actions, lack of reform, lack of accountability. We've heard, also heard that the Office of Independent, or I'm sorry, of uh, Internal Affairs is, is not subject to the Chief of Police, it answers to the mayor. Although it was Chief Medina who stated to the press that the Albuquerque City Police Department Motors Unit would investigate his crash, 
and internal affairs would conduct investigations into his policy or potential policy violations. That gives the appearance that they do answer to him. It certainly sounds like we will be using sworn officers to gather evidence, testimony, and draw conclusions about his conduct, the cause and results of the crash. The conduct or the assessment of appropriate police conduct, it is under the purview of the executive branch to review that. Ultimately, it's often decided in legislative and judicial. We cannot expect the police to police themselves without oversight. I would ask that the legislative the council here today exercise oversight. I'm not drawing conclusions on the results of the investigation. I'm making sure that we make, we remove any apparent cause, right? Any obvious conflict of interest in who conducts the investigation and the conclusions they draw. Then we take appropriate actions afterwards to make sure it doesn't happen again. We need to restore trust in the police department Albuquerque deserves better. Thank you. Rudolph Serrano, followed by Andrea Calderon. Uh, President Don Luis, uh, members of the council. First, I want to congratulate Michael Reilly for new director of emergency management for our city. I think uh, that's a great call. Uh, intelligence is what we need, especially when we're talking to a city that is the number one object for a terrorist attack. We have 350 terrorists that crossed the border within the last year, according to the FBI. And we are one of the targets. And uh, analyzing that, I was analyzing uh, what area could be, you know, be hurt. And I follow the LGBT community because it happens that when they reach 10%, they destroy the whole community where they live at. And we have 10% of LGBT community in the university area. And we can follow it by the SDGs that we have the number one in the nation. And they come also with AIDS. My brother, I mean, is, is, is one of them. And, 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 and they infect each other as, as, a, as a sport, you know. And I'm more concerned for children. You know, these STG statistics are coming with a, at least a, a 2,000% increase in lesbians and 1,000% increase in gays, but most of the concern is the children. Why are all children infected with STG? What are we doing to investigate who is infecting our children with STG and to do a criminal investigation and put criminal charges in these people and telling them, your rights ends when the children rights begin because they do have rights and they deserve the best just like everyone else so let's let's think about our children because that's what's going to decide next election you know it's, it's either you guys protect our children or hispanics are going to co come back for republicans thank you andrea calderon followed by rick happy woman's Lynch here on zoom Hi, good evening, Council. Thank you for having us at Public Comment once again. Um, I'm actually here to talk to you and encourage you all to um, hold a budget transparency night. In other cities, this is called a taxpayer's night, and it is an evening where the public gets to come, um, usually in a gallery walk format, and see the budget that City Council has approved um, and where the money is actually going at various departments um, and to which interventions they will, um, you know, flood in, or go into, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I think this would be a great move for government transparency in Albuquerque. Um, the only way that residents are currently able to keep up with budget allocations is to sit through budget hearings, which as you all know, um, our several and several hours are quite exhaustive. I've sat through um, a couple of, you know, a good number of those last year, and it's just not something that I would anticipate that um, mothers, that folks with families, that students would be able to really spend the time to do. So, um, you know, I think this is something that is a non-political event. Um, it would be really great to see that kind of collaboration occur across the chambers of government with the legislative branch and the executive branch. 
Um, and I just think it would be, um, you know, I just want to encourage you to encourage administration, while I have the administration's ear, um, to uh, have their budget office lead the way um, in having that kind of event that would really um, allow the public to have better insight into what's going on at the city. Um, I, I also would recommend that the Indicators Progress Commission be a part of that process because I think they've really um, developed some community indicators um, that residents have given input in, but they really want to see the, uh, the needle you know, move on um, to improve the well-being of residents. And so this would be a great way to uh, see how interventions match up with those community conditions and the shift that's happening there. Sorry, sorry for going over my time. Thank you all so much. Up next on Zoom, we have Rick Letcher, followed by Rowan Gallagher. Hello, my name is Rick Letcher. I live at 805 Manzano Street Northeast. I am speaking today in favor of adopting a new article amending Housing Code Chapter 14, Article 3. I live next door to a substandard property. This address is 5005 Mountain Road Northeast. The property is boarded up and has been under... Uh, city code enforcement custodianship for four years. Currently, the property owner is awaiting trial, trial for felony charges related to a SWAT situation that occurred on the property on January 24th. The property property owner has a vast history of criminal activity compounded, compounded with mental illness and drug addictions, which leaves the property owner incapable to render repairs or to make the property safe for lawful human habitation. APD was called on on the property 18 times in the month of January. In the month of February, the property owner set fire to the residence in which 11 AF, AFD and APD units were dispatched. During the owner's last incarceration at MDC, the property, owner, the property was broken into last week and copper thieves gutted the main electrical panels, pulled down uh, P&M electrical service from the overhead power lines, leaving the main electrical power lines exposed to an adjacent property. These dangerous situations are in close proximity to my house, putting my family and my neighbors at risk. This is why I'm speaking in favor of the administrative demolition ordinance to be adopted into housing code. The concerned citizens in the Palo Alto neighborhood have created a watch group to monitor these dangerous situations and have recently met with APD Commander Del Greco and city code enforcement officials, Mr. Kaiser and Ms. Moorfield last month. Commander Del Greco has de deemed the property owner a violent criminal with mental illness and a danger to the community. Code enforcement officials have asked our neighborhood group to appeal to city council, highlighting the relevant nature in which adopting this new article into housing code would mitigate dangerous situations for our neighborhood and others in our community. Thank you. Rowan Gallagher, followed by Jeff and Syra Chenoweth. Good evening, members of the City Council. My name is Rowan Gallagher and I'm 17 years old. I'm here to talk about something that's really impacting my neighborhood. I live near San Mateo and Lomas in the Pueblo Alto neighborhood. Across the street from my house is a house that's been boarded up for four years. The owner is in and out of jail and whenever he gets out, he comes back to the house. Just in the past month, we've had the SWAT team, police and fire department there. The house is strewn with garbage and recently had a fire. From what I'm told, the fire wasn't bad enough to demolish the house right away, but the fire department marked it with a red X to warn people that it's dangerous. I've been woken up by the sound of windows breaking, the owner yelling, and rocks hitting cars. My mom told me that the police were called there 18 times in January and 118 times in the past four years. Just recently, on February 6th, I woke up to lights and sirens at midnight when the man set his house on fire. The proposed bill to speed up the demolition of houses like this one seems like an important step to help manage the situation. I heard about a similar house that took 20 years to demolish, and if that happens here, I don't think we can stay in this neighborhood. Demolishing this house is the only way that we can get our lives back. I'm here to support the bill and to urge you to do the same. I know there are other houses like this in the city and that our situation isn't unique. I also feel for the owner. He has mental illness and there isn't a good place for him but we have to feel safe in our homes. And right now we don't. Thank you for your time. Up next, we have Jeff and Sarah Shenoweth, followed by David Gargoni. Jeff. 
Jeff and Sarah Chenoweth, followed by David Gargoni. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the City Council. My name is Jeff Chinaweth. I live in the Pueblo Alto neighborhood across the street from 5005 Mountain Road Northeast. I'm here to show my support for the Code 14 Article 3 proposed an administrative demolition ordinance. For the past 13 years, we have lived in this neighborhood. And before the current owner had any involvement, it felt like a really safe neighborhood. Uh, it's a shame that we spend less time outside and I no longer feel comfortable with our kids playing outside our back outside of our backyard due to the increased problems this house has attracted. When the owner is not locked up, he can pre frequently be heard yelling at the top of his lungs, threatening to kill neighbors, contractors, breaking things, throwing trash around and into the street, bringing trouble into the neighborhood along with drugs. He has broken my windshield with a large rock. He's damaged my wife's car as well as our neighbor's car. He has lit fires on his porch in the alley and inside of his house, almost burning it down. He has chased people from his house with a machete and chainsaw, ran from police whenever possible, and keeps everyone on edge constantly. He has caused several lasting police standoffs and SWAT situations and has caused the fire department to come out several times. He breaks into his boarded up house when he's not supposed to be there on the property at all. When he's locked up, the house attracts squatters and copper thieves. Before the fire damage, the house had holes in the floor, piled up stuff everywhere drug paraphernalia and, and excrement smeared all over the walls according to sources who entered it. Now the house has water damage, the ceiling and insulation have been removed and is beyond repair. The house will attract more and more trouble and is unsightly. This is a good neighborhood being dragged down by a neglected and dangerous property. The proposed bill is really the only solution for us to have a sense of peace and safety in our neighborhood again. Please consider the urgency of this matter as it means a lot to us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And then Syrah's here also. Sorry, we're on the same computer. Oh, please go ahead, Syrah. Um, do I need a timer? Uh, okay. You technically you did sign up, so please feel free. Good evening, my, uh, members of the city council. My name is Syrah Chinawith. I am 16 years old and I live in the Pueblo Alto neighborhood across the street from 5005 Mountain Road Northeast. I'm here in solidarity with my family, neighbors, and greater community to show my support for the proposed administrative demolition ordinance. We have all been dealing with a very sad, distressing, and dangerous situation in regards to 5005 Mountain for at least the past four years. My little brother and I are not allowed to walk by that house because of all the dangerous things that are constantly occurring there. I love my neighborhood, but this house and all the crazy things happening there makes me feel like I live in a bad one. The house has been boarded up for years and no one is supposed to go inside, but just a couple of weeks ago, me and my parents were awakened in the middle of the night to tons of lights and sirens because the owner broke in and set it on fire after having us all on edge in the days before by starting a fire in the alleyway right by my house and then one on the front porch of 5005 Mountain. When I woke up, I thought my house was on fire, and when I knew it wasn't mine, I got very worried for my neighbors on the other side of the wall from where the fire was. Just last week, one of the boards to the house was removed and a window was broken out, in addition to an electrical line being cut and left dangling in the alley. When the owner isn't there, which is often, it seems to be a magnet for trouble, like people doing drugs there or just trying to get inside. And when the owner is out of jail, he not only, um, uh comes to the house and throws garbage glass large rocks and furniture all over uh not only his yard but also the street and even other people's yards we were told at one time that he was allowed to be there during daylight to fix his house up but he just stayed all night and never fixed anything he actually started destroying more things every time he was there my biggest fear now is the house being on fire again and someone else's house burning too um and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak um, and I hope the bill is passed. I appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, we have David Gorgoni. Good evening. Good evening, members of the city council. Good evening. I th can you hear me? I hope. Yes, we can. Good evening, members of the city council. 
My name is David Gorgoni. I was born in Albuquerque and currently live in the Pueblo Alto neighborhood in Northeast Albuquerque. Over the past 10 years, I've noticed an increase in boarded up, destroyed and uninhabitable commercial and residential structures in our city. In our area, many have been broken into and some set on fire. But this isn't just about my neighborhood. This is about all the quadrants in our city. I used to wonder why the city or the property owners didn't take care of these properties. What was wrong? Well, now I understand. It's not that simple. Living near a commercial strip mall disaster and across the street from a troubled residence, I've learned the city is doing what they can under the current ordinance time frame guidelines. Um, but the issue affects all of us. We're all in this together, but the current ordinance seems to favor protecting the property owner over the safety rights and well being of the neighborhood. By speeding up the time from notification to demolition under the revised ordinance, we can better protect our citizens. It's crucial for the safety of AFR, AFD, PM, the gas company, and the code enforcement personnel. If not addressed expediently, these properties become continuously attractive nuisances and a safety hazard to people who pass by. Well, thank you for listening, and I urge you to support this ordinance. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the council will take a 30 minute recess.
Okay, we're back. We're on uh, approvals item 13 on our agenda tonight. Um, item A is EC 383. This is declaring 508 First Street Northwest non essential uh, for municipal purposes. I move approval. Okay. Uh, motion and approval, very, or motion and a second from various counselors. We'll say Councilor Grout. Uh, counselors, any uh, discussion um, on EC 383? Uh, Councilor Champagne. I just have one question for the administration. The um, price, is, do we have a set price that we're selling this or? Um, Mr. President, Councillor um, Champagne, I all of a sudden couldn't remember your name, I apologize. <laughs> um, we um, have an appraised value on this property. Um, if we made the decision to uh, sell it by auction, then we use uh, the auction house to do that. I want to, if I may, just address that um, making this, um, moving this forward does not mean that we have to sell the property. This allows us the opportunity to consider multiple options, one of which is selling. The other is that it could, it would allow us to move this property into um, MRA as a developable pro property that could be developed as well through the MRA process. It also allows for us to, um, any entity that has capital outlay dollars to make an improvement that might be interested, whether that's a, likely a nonprofit that may have that, it allows us the opportunity to also discuss the possibilities with them. So I want to be very clear, our intent is not necessarily that we have to sell. We want to give ourselves the opportunity to have a more robust conversation in the community for the uh, use of this property. Okay, Mr. President, the reason why I ask is that that specific deal, knowing the plans for the rail trail there, that's prime location that if it was for a profit, then why not wait till later when um, it's valued Mr. more? Mr. President, um, Councillor Champagne, you know, our, our interest is really looking at the possibilities and we want to be in a position to consider all of these options. Um, our goal is for this to be activated for a good quality use um, on the street that it's on there. As you all know, we've made improvements with the Marquette um, continuation that's just south of it. And we think that um, in ensuring that the building doesn't sit just empty is the best opportunity for us to engage in these discussions. We are looking for the opportunity to explore the possibilities. And by doing this, it opens up many other possibilities as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Grubb. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, um, can you tell us if there are people that are interested in this property? Mr. President, Councillor Grout, we have had um, folks that own property adjacent to it um, express interest in knowing what our plans are. They've expressed interest in understanding the types of uses we would consider because they have the developments that they have on that street. Um, so they have been paying attention and um, are interested in whether or not we would be uh, selling or looking for a development. So the all of the other businesses in the area, not all of them, I should say, several of the businesses in the area have expressed interest in this process and have been paying attention and um, are, are, have talked about the possibility of purchase if we make the decision to sell. Thank you, Mr. President. One more question. What were those things that you, um, you told, you know, you, they asked about and what were the options that you were expressing? Um, thank you, Mr. President and Councillor Grout. Um, as an administration, we've had multiple discussions about several nonprofits that are looking for um, the ability to improve a space for their specific needs. Um, and um, none of them have entered in into any sort of commitment, to, so I don't want to imply that we have any commitments, but we do have several nonprofits that have discussed needs for performing spaces or arts gallery spaces. Um, Again, no agreements. Or uh, We also have thought about whether or not through MRA development, if there are businesses that are interested in being located at downtown, if we have the opportunity to utilize the facility for um, a business to grow or start in the area. Um, and so we're really in, we really hope to be in a position to have a much broader open discussion about those based upon it being considered non-essential for the city. And we can think through all of those options. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Would it be a good place for an emergency shelter? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, or Mr. President, thank you, Councilor Grout, for the question. Um, based upon the location and the limitations mm -hmm. of, um, of this building, I think it's important to note there's two parking spots in front of this spot. 
Um, the access to it is semi-limited. Um, and based upon the improvements that have happened in the, in the neighborhood there, um, we did at one time um, uh, assess it for that purpose and found that some of the limitations of the value, uh, that are in there, it does not have um, it, you know, improvements that would lend itself to being a um, shelter in its current condition. Thank you very much. Council Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, seen it before. I just don't want to see it again. Hopefully, if this if this lies in the rail trail, are we going to be seeing it repurchased as a city property later on? <laughs> and Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, that is not our intent. Um, that is why we actually want this to be an opportunity for us to consider all of the uses, so that we make a well-informed decision as we move through this. And it's important to note: it doesn't mean that we have to. Um, dispose of the property. We want to be in a position that we can consider these other options. The only thing that's, that concerns is if we get rid of the property, sell it at a lower price, and then turn around and buy it for the rail trail at, an, at, at a higher price, then that mm -hmm. is an appearance of impropriety that we just can't accept. Uh, councilors, any other discussion, questions? Anybody sign up to speak on this? No, Mr. President. No? Okay. All right, other discussion, questions? Um, all right, this, this bill, this is, is an EC. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Uh, those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes, those opposed, no. Motion, motion passes unanimously. Um, EC 33 is the Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency 2023 Annual Report. I move receipt be noted. Uh, motion second for Councilor Passan. Um, yeah, Councilor, this is a receipt being noted. I think everybody's seen this report. It's in your iPads. We, uh, um, you know, went over in committee. If you have any questions about it, I'm glad to do that. But I think, it, again, we're just receiving noted. I, I just want to comment on it. Um, you know, there, we have a lot of MRAs all around the city. And, uh, you know, when comparable to the amount of MRAs, I think you've got to acknowledge that we could be doing a whole lot more, and this program could be a lot more effective. I think, you know, Mr. Bruner, you know, uh, and others have really uh, been pushing for, you know, more public involvement, and there's a bill before the legislature right now. I know the administration is supportive of that, and certainly something that we, uh, I think, need to uh, really, really push forward uh, for, you know, we, we want to get things done, and we want to incentivize development and growth in these areas, and uh, I think it's going to take a lot more than our current, you know, MRAs to be able to do that. So. Uh, but councilors, any discussion, questions? Uh, anybody sign up to speak on this? No. No, no, no speakers. Um, councilors? All right. Again, a receiving notice been moved and seconded. Those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so our item C is EC35, Emergency Purpose Purchase of Migrants Sheltering Service to Avoid Interruption in Service While FEMA Grants uh, Funds Are Being Competitively uh, Procured. A move approval. A motion second by Councillor um, Rogers. Anyone sign to speak on this? No, Mr. President. Okay. Council, any discussion? Um, have, have just a, um, uh, a few questions on this. My understanding is that um, all, all of this is grant funding from FEMA. Um, is that correct? That even the even the original money from 2022 was was grant funding. Uh, Council President, we do have grant funding for this, and we bill every opportunity that we have. We will bill the federal government. Uh, some of this money has not been reimbursed. Like they will reimburse for certain expenses. We will bill everything that we possibly can, but they don't uh, reimburse us 100 percent. So the, not the all original, of this money. Um, I think it was $200,000 uh, that, uh, um, do, you, do you know where that specific money came from? Was that out of the general fund? It, it would have been, I believe it would have been appropriated out of the general fund. And we've had that question earlier tonight um, from council staff, and we are looking to find that specific appropriation. Um, so that we can respond back, and we will have an answer uh, back to you. I just don't we don't know if answer. it came out of the grant fund or the general fund. Do we do we not know that? And I I think it was kind of an omnibus type of a. I don't I don't believe it was before the council specifically for this funding. I think it was grouped together in some 
cleanup funding in December of 2022, but did, do we not know whether it came from grant the grant fund or the general fund? Council President and Councilors, the oftentimes we make expenditures, we'll make expenditures out of the grant fund and we will get reimbursed by a granting agency. Um, but at the end of the day, anything that doesn't get reimbursed, we cover with the general fund, right? We, we don't have like a, a, a grant fund that just has um, matching funds in it. We, we always match with general fund money if we have to. Have we received any <laughs> grant funding uh, for it? Yes, I can go back to those, uh, Council President, we can go back to those details. We did um, research that um, last council meeting, and I, I want to say, I don't, don't quote me on this, I want to say we've received um, thirty to 50000 um, back from the federal government, and we continue to bill um, expenditures. So, so Councilors, I, 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 we still don't know. I mean, this went through our committee. We had questions about... Um, you know, the original funding, where it came from, this new funding, which says it's going to be, um, uh, you know, covered by FEMA, you know, grant funds, that's in the title. Um, and, and honestly, we still don't know whether this came from the grant fund or out of the general fund. Um, correct, Mr. Padillo? I don't think we, we know that, correct? Yeah. Council President, we are doing the research on it to see. It looks like could some money could have been fund, spent out of Fund 265. Other money might have been general fund, but we're trying to piece it together. Our staff's been looking at it to see what we can find. So again, we don't know if this money came originally out of out of 265 or out of the general fund, um, and, uh, and 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 because of that, I'm just not willing to do that. I, I'd, I'd rather us wait till we get the grant funding. I, apparently, I think we were we, we, that we were approved a grant from FEMA um, for a, a whole bunch more money. I'd rather us, I'd rather us, uh, you know, wait on this until that grant funding comes through. Councilor Grant or Councilor Brown. The director, you'd like to address? Good evening, Council President and members of the council. I don't know that I can answer the specific question about that funding. However, all of the FEMA reimbursement is on a reimbursement basis. They don't provide a grant like we normally typically see where they make a deposit into the city from which we spend. Every single grant dollar is one that is recouped from the federal government after many months of them going through the paperwork to make sure that every single dollar spent is in accordance with the FEMA rules. So all, all the money that we've spent so far, what, did it come out of 265, the, the grant, specific grant account, the fund, do you know? I don't know the answer to that because it's an accounting type question. Again, I, I just think this is something we should know before we vote on this. So um, uh, I, I don't think this came before the council originally as, a, as specifically toward this, this project. Um, I don't think it's good practice for us to be able to, to, to vote on this, especially when we don't know what account that it's coming from. So um, I don't know, councilors, any other discussion? Question? So I'm, I'm going to recommend a deferral. Go ahead. Mr. Council President, so whether it comes out of the grant fund or the general fund, we don't have money just sitting in the grant fund. So like the director said, we, we expend money, we request reimbursement, much like we do with the state. We expend money, we um, request, request reimbursement, and we don't generally get 100% of our reimbursements back. So whether it came out of the grant fund 265 or whether it came out of general fund 110, at the end of the day, it's whatever's not reimbursed, whatever expenditures we make that aren't reimbursed are, are covered by the general fund. We don't have a balance in the grant fund. Um, and, and typically, you know, we would expend funds negative in that fund and get a reimbursement and, and put it back, much like you would draw your bank account down and then get reimbursed by, by someone. But again, I, I don't know how this even came before the council originally. Um, I know that the council didn't specifically vote to put this funding into this, this service. Um, I think it was grouped together in some way. It was, again, it was kind of a cleanup bill at some point. You know, the council never made a decision to do this specifically. Uh, from, I mean, even in a bill like this, it's, uh, it specifically says these are grant funds. And yet, if you're saying that we're going to spend general fund money and there's really no guarantee, of, of grant funds, then I don't like that. You know, I don't think it's, the, it's, it's, it's good practice. So, Councilor Rogers. Mr. President, I think it's important to note that this is also, our deferring it will also hold up 
the payment to our vendor who has already completed the work. Um, and so I just want us to know that deferring that would, would, that, would that affect their payment, the vendor? That's what I'm worried about is making sure whatever we do isn't going to hold up the vendor who did the work already to get paid. Um, Council President, uh, Councillor uh, Rogers, uh, we will not hold payment to the vendor. We will pay the vendor and we'll work this out among us on the back end. That's a part of the problem. I mean, you, so have you spent more than $100,000? Council President, we are before you because we have spent uh, more than $100,000. Well, thank you. I mean, you've already spent over $100,000. And so, I mean, I believe our charter <laughs> says that, that uh, you know, in order to spend over $100,000, you have to come back to us and get approval for it again. But you've already spent $100,000. And so, again, I think that's a mute point. It's going to happen anyways, you know, with the way uh, the administration's operating these funds. So I'm going to move a deferral at least till, you know, two weeks. I have a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor I have a question. You said that we won't get reimbursed 100%. How much do you anticipate us to get reimbursed? Council President, Councilor Grout, I don't, I can't estimate that at this point. I think so far we've been, I think we've seen 25 to 30 percent reimbursement on the fund based on what I remember from our calculations last time. Um, and it's possible that we will get additional reimbursements from the federal government. Going forward, um, you know, the, the new grant that we have that we have uh, was awarded for 700 and some odd thousand dollars. Um, going forward, um, we will bill, again, just like this one, we will bill every expenditure that we think is um, applicable and we will, you know, request reimbursement for those going forward on the Thank new you. grant. Mr. President, could you get us a list of what you think, what are the expenses that are reimbursable versus the ones that are not? I'm very, very curious. We. We can get that for you. I do know the new grant is very broad. Uh, the, the new grant that we are seeking um, a contract um, administrator for, the new grant is everything from temporary shelter, food, um, emergency or acute medical care. There's also transportation costs that are reimbursable. Um, and I will say, you know, we will bill the federal government for any transportation costs. If we have an individual that has been released from ICE custody and they need to move on to a forward destination, we will pay for that to get them to their sponsor or their next destination, and we will bill the federal government for that. Thank you. Um, how many people is this um, handling? Like, these, this money, how much? So President and members of the council, the um, number of migrants who presented in Albuquerque and were assisted by us in the calendar year of 2023 was a total of 1,061 migrants. Thank you. Our follow-up, are those migrants still here? No, the vast majority have onward destination almost immediately. Sometimes they have plane tickets or bus tickets same day. Other times they don't have that same day and they need overnight shelter or assistance getting that. And on an occasion, some of them do choose to settle in Albuquerque because they don't have any other plans or people that they're trying to connect with. Thank you. Thank you. Also, okay. Feeble Court. Thank you, Mr. President. So. I just want to be very clear. Um, what happens if this is not approved, the $50,000? Um, what services would not be provided to folks in need? Mr. President and members of the council, the services um, that are being provided right now are what I've described in terms of there's a volunteer group of folks who help meet migrants at the Sunport and at the bus station and help them kind of triage to see what kind of situation they have. And if they have onward travel right away, then they're assisted to go through TSA. They have legal documents that help them get through security. And, um, and then those that don't are transported to the shelter to get further assistance. So they'll get some emergency food, they get some basic clothing, 
and a place to rest and charge their phones and make that contact with their family or others that they're connecting with. So that's what's being missed, is it would fall on the shoulders of city staff, which are very few of us doing this, and volunteers who have been doing this at no cost and raising their own money since 2019. So we would not have a contractor able to do this for which we can seek reimbursement. Thank you, Mr. President. So I, I first of all, thank you for the work that everyone has done to make sure that um, immigrants are welcomed into our community and helped to get where their final destination is. Um, my concern is that if we're not going to allocate $50,000, which in the grand scheme of things in the city's budget that is $1.4 billion, um, that says a lot about how we um, treat our migrant friends. Um, but also I'm very concerned that my, my partner has been one of the volunteers who went out and helped folks figure out what their next step was. And um, without city staff and without some assistance, I'm very, very concerned that people will fall through the cracks. They will not get the assistance they need. And we might see more of them staying in Albuquerque because they literally might not be able to find their way beyond Albuquerque. And it just seems like a very small price to pay to make sure that we are greeting people when they arrive in our country, helping them to their destination. I think you sent out something that said that the average cost per Migrant was $257. $257, and that seems like a really good thing for us to do. Whether or not we get reimbursed by the federal government is, in my mind, irrelevant. $257 to help someone start their new life is a reasonable amount. Um, Thank you. Council President, I wanted to uh, clarify one point. that What is before you is notification from the mayor of an emergency procurement, um, and under uh, Ordinance 5, 519, uh, the mayor may approve those, and then he provides notification to the council. And so th this... Sure. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. And we've already answered that question. So we there was $200,000 that was put into a fund, or put in, designated. Um, anywhere from $100,000 to $150,000 has been spent. Um, and, and now you guys come to us and say, hey, we need another you know, $50,000 because of that. Um, but you've also said you're going to spend the other $50,000 anyways. You know? So the answer to the question of whether... Are we going to help people or not, or is it, going to, is it going to happen or not? No, you're going to spend it anyways. What I'm saying is that you need to come back before us and say that this money is specifically, whether it's general fund. I mean, start with general, general fund money. Say, look, we're going to budget or we're going to spend this amount of money, whether we get reimbursed or not. But this bill says that it's going to be reimbursed by FEMA. Uh, that says that in the title. And so, uh, you know, bring it back with uh, uh, the specific funding that's going to come out of the general fund. That's, that's why I'm going to move for a deferral. Council Rogers. Um, Director Melendez, I just wanted to see, in addition to the information, would you also send the council a definition of the difference between asylum seekers, uh, undocumented folks, and refugees, just so we understand that asylum seekers are going through the legal process um, to be here. So I think that's really important to note that that's, we're talking about asylum seekers here. Is that correct? Yes, Council President and, and Madam, or Member Rogers, yes, we're talking about people who have been given a credible fear interview, is, is what it's called, by the U.S. government, Homeland Security, to see whether they have a credible fear of being returned to their country. And once they pass that first hurdle, then they're eligible to seek asylum and go before an immigration court. And so those are the documents that they're carrying while they're traveling legally in the United States. And these folks also have authorization after a period of time to work legally in the United States while they're making their new life and um, getting integrated into the American society. So I move a deferral for two weeks. Uh, second. Seconded by Councilor Champagne. Uh, any other discussion on the deferral? Uh, motion is made and seconded. Those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Uh, those opposed, no. Uh, pass on the 5-4. So we'll go to uh, uh, final actions, Council Prasad. Mr. President, 01CS, the committee substitute administrative dem demolition of unsafe commercial buildings, unsafe accessory structures or dwellings unfit for human habitation, adopting a new article in Chapter 14 and amending the Uniform Housing Code Chapter 14, Article 3, and move it to pass. A motion and a second by uh, Councilor Fubicorn. 
Mr. President, this is by request. I would invite uh, Director Varela or the administration to go ahead and summarize some of it. I think there might be some comments, and I do see that we have a one amendment pending. Yeah. Uh, Council President, Council, good evening. Uh, we're pleased to be here. We want to thank you for bringing this before the Council. As you heard from many of the public commenters, we have uh, challenges in our city when it comes to dangerously dilapidated properties. Uh, you know that because I've been before you quite a few times over the last couple of years presenting uh, instances of those and seeking Council approval. Uh, what this bill will do is it will uh, ensure that the objective measures that we use to make sure that it's been inspected, that it actually is structurally unsound or unsafe and such, the same information we bring to you when we go to council, that those stay in place uh, so there's nothing subjective about the decision. However, rather than going through the council process uh, at the beginning, we will go to an independent hearing officer and go through that process. That process will be uh, quicker than going to council. I do understand that there is a proposed amendment to this bill. We had initially drafted it so that the appeals would go to district court rather than the council. Uh, the amendment, uh, which the administration does not object to in any way, is for an appeal of the independent hearing officer's a decision to come to city council. So you would still get a bite at the apple, so to speak, in these matters if somebody does appeal that. Um, and with that, we'll stand for questions. Mr. President, I just want to make sure to clarify uh, through my conversations with the director. I mean, this is not to say that this is going to uh, circumvent any part of the process when it comes to evaluating which properties are going to be deemed substandard or, or be on the list for uh, potential demolition. And correct me if I'm wrong, director, but this is something, too, that there's still at least a 12-month process, at least, that code enforcement and the planning department already go through to make sure to give proper notification to the different property owners to allow for communication and, and remedies. Uh, and so it's just that, you know, there comes a point where, in my opinion, and I have been guilty of this, that when there is an appeal or, or when, when planning comes to us at council, it definitely sometimes is, is easy for us to say, hey, this is a constituent in my district, so now I am going to move a deferral for 90 more days. And almost every time since I've been here, we pretty much always vote to, if not always, vote to go ahead and go with the original recommendation. And so I think that this will allow for us to streamline the process while still offering the right kind of treatment and communication with constituents and property owners in Albuquerque um, and then, you know, for, for the potential amendment that seems like it's going to be coming down the hopper on that, I think also it would make it so that we would be able to, as a, as a council, be able to evaluate based off of whether or not the hearing officer checked the boxes right and did the evaluation properly, rather than on what I, I look at as sometimes some fluffy feelings that we might have because we really, really want to represent our constituency to the, to the fullest. But sometimes it's not about how we feel so much as how the process has been unfolded and what's best for the city and for everyone else as well. Are councilors any other discussion, questions for the director? Councilor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. How can you be sure that the appeal process will be faster if it takes place at district court? And uh, Council President and Councilor Grout, uh, that is why we agreed to the amendment to where the appeal will actually go to you, to City Council, not to District Court. But how, how do we know that when it goes to court, District Court, it will be faster? And like what is Council President Lewis and Councilor Grout, I'm having trouble making sense of that question. Because if, for example, now city council had made the decision and it was a, that decision was appealed to district court, the city now has no control over district court timing of any matters, and uh, it's an, that's a separate branch of government entirely. So mm -hmm. I, this this bill has nothing to do with the speed of district court. Mr. President, 
if I may help. Yes, Ms. Thank you, Mr. President, Councillor. I think, if I'm understanding correctly, if there was, if planning were to come to us at Council and we were to vote um, to demolish a property and then the person and property owner would to decide to appeal our decision, they could then take it to district court. Correct. Yeah. This would, as written, the bill would skip the, the part of us mm -hmm. and allow for it to go to district court. But then with the amendment, because the dis, the develop the hearing officer is added into that, now there's that legal aspect of it that's happening on the front end of it rather than on the back end of the situation, if I'm correct. That, 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 is, that is all correct, yes. And I don't mean to somehow imply that um, I don't appreciate your question. I just don't understand how that, that has nothing to do with the bill. And when I talked to you before and I asked you that same question, you and your helper um, told me you could not be sure we would be at the mercy of the court. Cor correct. It, it, and that's, that's the case with any decision made by council whatsoever, a land use decision, a zoning decision, anything that uh, is appealable to district court. The, the city is not in control of the district court's correct. time frames. That is correct. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. But the reason you were bringing this to us before us is because you wanted to do this everything quicker. And so how do we know that this updated process is going to make things happen quicker? So we, we have several bases for knowing that's going to happen. First of all, um, independent hearing officers don't go dark part of the year. Uh, independent hearing officers are at the beck and call of the uh, of, of the city. They're on contract, and so they don't have to fit something into their very busy agenda like city council does. Um, if a matter is presented to the independent hearing officer through a uh, you know a notice of violation and a petition for a hearing on it, that hearing will take place somewhere between 10 and 30 days from when that is filed. Uh, unlike the council process which uh, when something gets introduced to council, council has to take into consideration all the other items on its agendas. Council then goes through a two week introduction process where it sits. Uh, council then will sometimes refer it to a committee uh, for consideration that delays it another month. And then within a few weeks to a month later comes back to council. We're now approximately three months into the process that would have taken the hearing officer 10 to 30 days to get to. Uh, and then once we get to council, uh, the matter is often deferred, and, uh, and Councillor Bassan was correct, uh, quite often deferred, and I can tell you that in every single one of those instances, uh, our heart all went out to the uh, property owner, and not a single dime, because they had been years and years in this process. We take this very, very seriously. We beg people to fix up their properties. It's a last resort. Every single one of those, we've come back and you've eventually issued the condemnation resolution and the thing has finally gotten uh, removed. So that, that's, been the way it, that's been the way it goes. So yes, this will shorten the process. I think it will also um, allow council to rather than hearing a litany of information from the planning department about the years and years, to actually review like you do with LUHO uh, a well-reasoned, focused, meaning that they didn't have divided attention with other agenda items, a well-reasoned, focused opinion issued by a hearing officer to determine whether you will uphold that or whether you will, uh, you will reject that. Thank you. And one final question. You mentioned um, that we have a long agenda and um, if you can get it on the agenda, has how many times when you've asked for something to go on the agenda, has it not gone on that the agenda that you requested? Probably countless times. There are strict deadlines for getting stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, getting getting the legislative packages uh, to the eleventh floor to draft the uh, the goldenrod packet, which has the cover memo, the FIA, uh, all the other analysis that's required. If we miss that deadline, which is, I believe, approximately a week before introduction period at council, then we have to wait until the next round. 
Uh, if it then uh, gets, if we make that deadline, but we don't have time to confer for the EC packet to make sure it's accurate, then there's another delay there. So I would say most of the time it takes longer than when we're ready to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I, um, you know, I, I definitely understand there's a need, and, and uh, um, I, I just disagree with the premise. Um, if, the, if the issue is, is speeding up the process, or, um, then the premise is that the, you know, the council's you know, slow with it. That's one thing. I think we can argue that and talk about that. The other is that the council's wrong. You know, the council was wrong for deferring it. And I just don't agree with that premise. I think if we, uh, if we agree with this, we have to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of saying that the council has made wrong decisions regarding hearing a case uh, and then deferring it. And, and I think, uh, I can't say that. I can't say that this council, even though I didn't, you know, vote on that every single time, a deferral, um, I can't say that the council was wrong because that's been the process, that is the process uh, for going through that. And so um, I, I don't think that, I mean, we can get bills uh, going through here pretty quickly. Um, you have a deadline until really on Friday um, is, the, is, the, is the deadline. I mean, the, the main process is to get it through and get to, get to, uh, get to the administration and us by uh, Tuesday, but, you know, bills can still be introduced uh, with proper, you know, requests. Um, and then, uh, uh, and bills can go directly to the, um, you know, to council meetings, and um, they don't have to go through a long process. And so there, there might be some other ways that we can, we can fix that. But again, the other reasoning is that, hey, it's just slow because the council's been wrong, and I can't agree with that either. Um, I don't believe that the council's been wrong, it's, it's certainly not every time. And so, um, so again, it, when this goes back to the, hey, let's speed it up, and it's taken too long because the, you know, the council process and the council always defers it. Well. Then you got to then you then you got to admit that the council's been wrong about it. I don't believe it has. Uh, council opinion. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm um, just a point of clarification. I think some of the um, public speakers um, were talking about houses and not necessarily commercial buildings, but I just want to just kind of try to um, explain my rationale here in terms of both the the housing and the and these commercial buildings, which the bill is about today, and it's not about housing, but just. I just want to say that, you know, this along with the commercial buildings, you know, I've watched over the years, I think I'm here, I've been here eight years, nine years, going on nine years now, and just, you know, I usually vote no um, to, to any um, demolitions or um, um, of, of homes. And, um, but I would just beg to say that I think maybe I can ask the staff to put together an amendment in here. I won't be supporting the bill either way. But um, an amendment in here to um, actually ask if we can have like the demographics and the socioeconomic status of the folks that the houses or the buildings um, that get demolished where they're at because um, just recently you know there was one that we had it was a long time it was an Asian lady who had a business um, in um, I think the southeast and you know she really didn't have the money I would venture to say that anybody on this council, if we had an issue with our house and we had burned part of our house down, we would be able to figure out how to refinance or get some capital to be able to fix our house. But um, many times when these cases come in front of us, they're really like hardship cases. They just don't have the money or the resources to go and refinance their building or refinance their house or have the insurance. And they are, they're trying to hold on to their property as long as they possibly can. And I think that's why, um, alluding to what Councillor um, Lewis is suggesting, is that we're not wrong. Because when you have someone like this lady, who eventually the vote was to, to do what we do, um, we weren't wrong because we kept on giving her opportunity after opportunity. Unfortunately, because of her hardship, she just didn't have it. So at the end of the day, she was forced to kind of say, hey, I'm, I can't fix it. Um, I can't afford to even pay the demolition fee. So why doesn't the city just go ahead and demolish it for me? It'll be on my taxes, and I'll sell it, and hopefully I'll be able to get at least some money from some of the, the business the property that I owned for so many years and maybe just land up with a handful of um, uh, handful of money compared to um, what she could have gotten. And I do see it as an opportunity for others who do have the resources. Lots Sometimes these properties are in prime areas, 
and they come in and they'll buy it and turn it into the wonderful thing that that same Asian lady had always envisioned it to be. So um, just to say that uh, I just, I will not be sort of supporting this bill. So thank you. Uh, Council Rogers, we're going to move the floor amendment or are we already? Okay, uh, Council Rogers. All right, I just wanted to echo, thank you, Mr. President, that we did do a floor amendment to add that. It's in our iPad, so I will get to that after this first amendment to add, because I had the same question, so thank you. And uh, so, Council Grab. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a floor amendment to um, Committee Sub 024-1. Um, on page six, beginning line three, revised as follows. The hearing officer shall issue and serve an order that advises the owner of the owner's right to file an appeal of the hearing officer's decision um, with the city council. The owner may file a written objection with the city clerk within 10 days of the receipt of the order asking for a hearing before the city councilor, council. The city clerk shall deliver the written objection to city council within 15 days of receiving the written ob objection. Such an appeal shall be heard after notice at the first available meeting of the City Council. City Council may affirm, reverse, or modify the decision of the independent hearing officer. Property owners uh, grie uh, grieved by the decision of City Council can appeal to District Court. And this amendment proposes to send appeals of the, um, I, the independent hearing officer to Council. Instead of District Court, appeals of the City Council decision would go to District Court. The process would go as follows, independent hearing officer, property owner has 10 days to appeal, appeal is submitted within 10 days to the clerk, clerk has 15 days to transmit to council, and council receives the appeal and schedules on the first available council meeting. So that's it. Give a second, so, give a second. second. Okay. Um, so, uh, Council Grouts moved the floor amendment. It's been seconded. Questions on the floor amendment? Um, we'll go for a vote then. Um, those in favor of the floor amendment say yes. Yes. Those opposed, no. Uh, all right, that passes. So, this is uh, 01, uh, the committee substitute as amended. Councilor uh, Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a, um, also an amendment to 0 24 1. Um, and I'd like to include what Councillor uh, Pena brought up about socioeconomic status, because I did not include that in my amendment. Um, and so right now it reads on page eight, thank you for the hard copy. President, Council Rogers, are you going to amend your amendment to include socioeconomic? Yes, please. And Councilor President um, and Councilor Rogers, can you explain again where that is? What we missed? So, it. We were trying to get the amendment. I mean, this was kind of described by Councilor Pinion. If we're going to add this, we probably that sounds like more than just writing a quick sentence. So, if we do this, I'm going to recommend we defer this whole thing. Well, we already actually, if I may, Mr. President, have a guide for the city of how to collect demographics. So we would just need to pull from that guide the approved questions that are already approved by city by the city on what demographics we could. We got to get language down uh, that Councilor Pena uh, mm -hmm. suggested here. So is that what you guys are you guys working on that right now, Mr. President? Councilor Passan. I think the amendment, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilor Rogers, but it would be the planning department shall track the race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status of the property owners, da 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 da, da. correct. So, so Councilor Pena, is that what you, the essence of yes. what you were wanting? Okay, so this, this amendment does that then? Yes, okay. and I'll second it, but I'll, I'll vote for the amendment. So the, so the, the, the recommendation <laughs> is for this amendment as it's written? Okay. Correct. 
Correct. So all we're doing is adding after race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status. Okay. All right. So everybody has that? We, we're clear on that and we're okay to vote for it? Okay. Vote on it. Uh, so that was, that's an amendment uh, moved by Councilor uh, uh, Rogers. We have a second. Second by Councilor Pena. Any other question, discussion on the amendment? Councilor Fiebkorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Just wanted to verify, I know uh, when we were looking at this, uh, these types of notifications, we have, this council has passed a requirement that um, other languages be included in the notification. Can you just walk us through um, that requirement now and how it's working? Uh, yes, the, the entire city, including the uh, planning department, has a, a language access requirement uh, pursuant to administrative policy as well as I think to council directive and so uh, we have translators on board uh, anytime anybody asks for a counselor I mean for a for a translator we also in the communication uh, provide the information to them as well letting them know that that's an offer uh, we've not had any instances whatsoever where somebody has uh, stated that they that English was not their first language for example and that they needed help with translating where that wasn't provided we're very active I have a deputy uh, two deputies actually, uh, Robin Rose, who's an attorney, and uh, James Aranda, who's a uh, certified master planner, uh, both of them in charge of making sure that's deployed throughout the department. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Council Bassan on the amendment. <clears throat> Mr. President, um, I'm, I guess I'm not fundamentally opposed to this, but at what point is tracking race, ethnicity, and so socioeconomic status actually negative? I mean, like, we're tracking this for data, but then at what point does it backfire and so we're actually tracking people now? And then I just, I would hate, and I don't know where that boundary is. How do we know um, whether or not we're doing something positive or negative when it comes to potential racism and, and tracking, so to speak, that people come back with? Well, I probably could offer. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the... Ideas is that it's, I don't, I personally as an equity practitioner don't see a harm that could be caused by tr making sure that um, we aren't seeing, because historically these things usually happen to poor folks and people of color, historically. And so for us, it's just the way, it, I don't think we're asking for it to be public, we're not asking for, um, it's just for us to make sure we're monitoring that and we know who it's affecting at the higher rate. Tracking data, uh, Director, do you see any, is your department has the ability to be able to do that, to track this data? Uh, yes, we certainly, there, there are um, right now uh, data questionnaires that are, are present in other departments in the city and would use one of those questionnaires. Okay, Council's other discussion on the amendment? Mr. President, uh, I do want to just... Council Bassan and Council Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to point out that it will be public if it's in the form of an EC, just to make sure that we're clear. Council Grout. Okay. Comment? Okay. Uh, our staff. <laughs> Very well, thank you. Well, Morris. Um, we just realized that there are two meetings for biannual, um, and we wanted to check whether you meant twice a year or every two years. That's what we thought. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, in the amendment, rather than using the phrase biannual, we'll use the word twice a year. All right, uh, the amendment's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, we're back on the bill as amended twice. Uh, back to sponsors or any other discussion? We'll go back to the sponsors close. I'll make just a quick comment. Um, I, uh, you know, again, I guess I'll just, you know, re-say this. I'm not sure if we're, I just don't, not sure if it's, it's, if it's really a problem. You know, um, I think the process is the process, even if it takes long, is 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 still good. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing when there's a long process. But at the same time, um, I think there's very few issues when it, relative. You know, um, and, and I really think, and and with with all respect to our our department, I know it's always a challenge, but I think there's some bigger challenges and bigger bigger problems when it comes to. Um, you know, our planning and, you know, uh, moving our permits forward and being able to make sure that we're, uh, we're really efficient as a department. And again, that's nothing negative on, on, on our 
department of director it's just that that's a need probably in every planning department in our whole in, in, in the country you know um I just want us to get better and better and better at that um and and focus on some of those things and i, I know that we're not you know focusing on this and in, in, in the place of that i'm just i just want to make a make a point of that so um but let's go back to the sponsor council Basan. mr president a couple things i want to add based off of the conversation um I wanted to add that part of what increases the timeline, even though it's it's fully within the purview of council, is oftentimes when it does get to committee, this, this type of bill, we defer it a few times in committee, and then it comes to full council where we then defer it a few more times. And so it does, elong I've seen it elongate the process quite a bit. Um, I respectfully disagree that by voting for this bill, it means that we're saying we were wrong before because I don't think the council has been wrong in deferring before, but I do think that we do need to increase efficiency. And that's what the purpose of this is, is to be able to increase efficiency while making sure that people get their property rights and their, their due diligence. And while we're talking about a city that is melting down with dilapidated, debaucherous, really problematic behavior. I think that it's very difficult for us to sit here and say, we should make sure to hang on to these properties that have had very elongated lengths of time to have an opportunity to rectify and repair their, their, prop, their commercial property, which is now becoming an increased magnet for further abuse, fire, danger, not only for our first responders, but for the community members who might be seeking shelter in there, might be lighting a fire, might be doing something on purpose in a negative fashion. There's a multitude of reasons. So for us to say that we want to clean up our city and be efficient and do our due diligence as a council, I absolutely believe that this bill will help smooth that out a little bit while also making sure that we keep property rights in balance for the city of Albuquerque and keep people safer uh, in a more efficient, expedious process so that it can be a little bit fairer for everybody. Uh, you know, I just think that, how, I do have one more question, though, um, Director. How many properties that we end up demolishing when it does come through the traditional process would you say could be sold to a different property owner to be refurbished and rebuilt without raising it to the ground? Zero. Okay. So I think that we have we also have a responsibility to the public to make sure that they are safe too and we prevent further damage and further danger from occurring and and do it in a, in a way that's best for them as well as as well as the owner themselves so I I do urge your support I think this would be a good decision for for Albuquerque uh, we do have a few speakers so um, Ms. Garrett or uh, Ms. Cornelius if you call the Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Tyler Richter, followed by, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, Ted Nowitzki. Good evening, counselors. I guess uh, I was here before. Um, I'm here again. Um, you've heard about some of the homes in, in my neighborhood. Um, I'm here representing the Pueblo Alto neighborhood. I'm here representing D7. Um, and um, I don't think anybody thinks that the council is wrong in demolishing some of these processes in some of these properties, but the process just takes too, too long. Um, and the public loses its faith, and we we, uh, we really stop believing that anybody on this council can do what they say that they're here to do. And I understand that we have a, a, um, a responsibility to commit to protect people's property rights, but at some point, inaction, inattention, budgets um, don't lend themselves to them being able to take care of their property. And um, it needs to be put back on the market, and it needs to be rehabilitated, and to serve a higher purpose for the city and county of Al or the city of Albuquerque. Appreciate it. Ted Nieminski, followed by David Gorgoni on Zoom.
Thank you, <coughs> my name is Ted Niemiecki. <coughs> I can see so many issues with this whole ordinance, residential and commercial, who give th them rights, but overall, who decided uh, which pro property are not suitable to live. I'm talking right here now about property recently been decided, but take it. That is Central and Wyoming across from McDonald's gas station. Uh, all owners could not compete, survive competing with big monopoly like Circle K or Sam's Club, etc., Murphy Oil, and so on. So, anyway, he will walk out simply that building is, was, is construction, all stone veneer outside. Who give them rights to, to walk inside? That was as the report says. And that's simply sell, 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 uh, lies. Who, uh, who was inside the uh, assess? Is it suitable or not? That has happened recently when he walked out. So anyway, doors are stone all, all the way around the building, uh, one building and another building, where it was car wash. It's all locked up, boarded. So anyway, this here is so many, many issues with whole ordinance about owner, homeowner, or property owner rights. And that I will go to district court. Oh, we're back on the bill. This is uh, uh, a one, me, Mr. Uh, President. Substitute one. Uh, we have one more. Oh, do we have one more? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank go you. Ahead. Uh, that is David Gorgoni on Zoom. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of City Council. Uh, I spoke once earlier, and uh, I'd like to reiterate, uh, I'm in support of this, uh, these changes and, uh, and the amendments. Uh, and I think that uh, the Council and uh, the zoning and code enforcement are protecting the commercial uh, property owner and the property rights of the homes. And this is something in all our quadrants. And the houses we're talking about and the commercial properties are those that have been open, broken into, or boarded up for several years. Um, and, and at that point, it can still go forward. Someone can still fix them up or uh, take ownership of them. But that doesn't seem to happen. And what I've seen in our neighborhood and uh, along San Mateo to in a uh, strip mall, it, it was an attractant to people uh, to break in again. And uh, sometimes um, it encouraged theft, fires, and uh, drug use, frankly. The police have tried to help, and uh, we really appreciate code enforcement. But some of these things happen over and over again until the property is uh, so dilapidated uh, it can't be rehabilitated. But please think about us, the constituents around these properties in all the quadrants. Thank you very much. That concludes comment, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, councilors, we had a long discussion and uh, a lot of questions and um, and already did our, our kind of our final uh, closing arguments, but anything else uh, before we go to a vote here? I Council have two Grob. more questions. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. What, um, somebody, the independent hearing officer, what are his qualifications or her qualifications? Do you hear this? And... Uh, Council President, Councilor Grout, the independent hearing officer uh, pursuant to the administrative hearing rule uh, would be a licensed attorney, somebody who has uh, a lot of experience listening objectively to evidence that's presented before them, making a ruling only based on that evidence, and then writing a, a coherent uh, decision that uh, is based on the 
proof points that are in the particular ordinance. Thank you. And follow up. Um, how long does he give that right away, that um, decision? What is that turnaround? And I don't have the exact figure right in front of me, but I believe he has to issue. It. They usually don't rule from the bench, uh, so to speak. They, uh, they, they issue a written decision, much like Luho does. And it would depend on the complexity of the information that they're filtering in in order to support uh, and prove that uh, their decision is based on evidence. Is, um, and but, but it would be within just a matter of a few days. A few days. Yes. Um, and then is when, when the matter is heard before the hearing officer, is it heard in one day and that's it, or is it also extended? That also would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would think that in most instances that the uh, information provided by code enforcement and building safety and the inspectors would take anywhere from uh, uh, oh, maybe a half an hour to an hour to present. Uh, depending on the witnesses we bring in, if we're bringing in AFR, which sometimes uh, we will, to talk about the danger and the fire hazard component of these properties that have had multiple fires in them. If we're bringing in APD officers to talk about the danger they face from being in these properties uh, and such, uh, then uh, we would have more witnesses than simply the building inspector to testify. So th those may take a bit longer, yes. Mm -hmm. And then whether it's continued to a later just depends on the the, uh, the particular case. But I would think most of them would be heard in one setting. Thank you. And this is for demolition. So you want to raise the property. It's not reconstruct. Co it's, correct. It is correct. To, to raise it, it. It, it's, it's when you get to the tail end of a bad property that's literally uh, falling down that we're getting dozens or even hundreds of calls on. Yep. Uh, APD calls, fire rescue calls, code enforcement calls from neighbors, from everybody who takes care of their properties. But as, as you heard these, the young men talking earlier, they can't even walk in front of that one house by them. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's those types of properties, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion for a due pass of committee substitute 01 as amended and seconded. Those in favor, say yes, raise your hand. Those opposed, no, raise your hand. No, uh, motion passes on a 7-2. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, uh, item B, Council Fiebercorn, um, O2. Thank you, Mr. President. This is O2, amending Chapter 14, Article 5, Part 1, Section 4 and 9, a portion of flood hazard and drainage control to replace FEMA zone designations with FEMA designated 100-year floodplain, et cetera. I am going to move a due pass. A uh, motion is seconded by Councilor Sanchez for a due pass. Councilors, any questions, discussion? Anybody sign up to speak first? No. All right, no speakers. Councilors, any discussion? Um, I do have an amendment. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce that amendment. This is uh, amendment number one. Uh, Councilors, it's in, in your iPads. Uh, if you look at amendment number one to 0242, um, this is in section one. You know, I just felt like we could, we could write this a little bit better. Sort of lands. Uh, could be explained a little more clearly and, and just really just point people to the to the IDO where it makes sense if there's any kind of uh, changes that we would simply uh, go to the IDO rather than uh, um, this possibly being seen as another you know regulation we should really have our regulations all in one place which is the IDO when it comes to um, you know when it comes to planning in this regard so um, if you read that it adds on there no site clearing grubbing or dirt work are permitted prior to the approval of a site plan if extensive lands analysis necessitates a site plan EPC approval per the IDO section 14 so again it really just directs people to the uh, to the IDO and the regulations that are in the IDO I think it's important um, and, and just can be easily followed when it comes to you know policymakers and people that are doing um, you know the kind of work that this would apply to so that's what that's what this amendment does a motion is second by Councillor uh, San Sanchez. Uh, discussion on the amendment? Um, all right. Uh, so uh, the amendment's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. A uh, motion passes. Uh, back in the bill, Councillors, any other amendments, questions, discussion? All right. Uh, no other discussion. We'll go to the vote. Um, Make sure I'm catching everybody. We'll go to vote. Uh, uh, this is again 02. Uh, it's been moved and amend amended. 
Uh, motion to second. Uh, so did I get all this right? I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. President. People are confused because I had an amendment in the iPad, but my amendment did exactly what your amendment did, so I'm not moving it. So I just wanted to, everyone seems concerned. We're good. <laughs> this is O2. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Uh, those opposed, no. Motion passes. We'll go to item C. Council Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is our four approving and authorizing the filing of attached grant application for Brian Discussionary Community Project Grant with the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, Bureau of Justice Affairs, and providing an appropriation to the Albuquerque Community Safety Department in fiscal year 24. I move for a due pass. Motion is second by Council Feeblecorn for a due pass. Uh, we have a floor amendment, Council Rogers. Thank you so much. Just the background is, is where this is a technical edit or a or technical item just to make sure that the grant numbers match correctly. Um, and so that's all this is for. So it's just a technical. All right. Uh, so the, do you need to move that, Council Rogers? Yes, I move for a due pass. Uh, so Council Rogers is moving the floor amendment number one. You second. A second by Council Baca. Um, any other discussion, comments on the amendment? Um, this is the uh, floor amendment to R4. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. We're back in the bill. Anyone signed up to speak? We do have one speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. We have Tad Nemitsky to speak on R4. Mr. Nemitsky, you want to speak on the bill? All right, let's move on. Uh, back, so we're back in the administration. Have any comment on it? Okay. Nope. All right, so back on the final bill as amended. Council Rogers, close. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge your support. Uh, bills have been moved and seconded. This is R4 uh, as amended. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. We'll go to item D. Councilor Pena, R8. Thank you, Mr. President. R8 is amending the adopted capital implementation program of the City of Albuquerque by approving new projects, supplementing current appropriations, and changing the scope of existing projects. I move a due pass. Second. I motion a second by Councilor Grout, uh, my, my Vice President Grout, uh, for a due pass. Uh, this is R8. Councilors, any uh, and then questions? Mr. We have President, uh, some floor amendment. Uh, back to either Councilor Baca, Feeble Corner, Grout. Mr. Mr. President, uh, floor amendment number one to R24-8, um, we're amending um, on page three after line 15, add in the following, um, and this is just moving funding around for uh, the WEC um, outdoor recreation space. Um, I won't go through it all, but the explanation at the bottom, uh, the amendment proposes moving old unused geo funds into the WEC outdoor space capital project and requires the um, administ administration to report on the expenses under the program, including a comprehensive breakdown of all cost and purpose of the expense. I need a second. Moved and seconded by Councilor. Moved and seconded by Councilor Rogers, by Councilor Feeblecorn. Okay, this is floor amendment number one. Questions on or discussion on floor amendment number one? Uh, that's been the amendment's been moved and seconded. Those in favor, raise your hand. Say yes. Yes. yes, those opposed, no. Motion passes back in the bill. Councilor Grout? Oh, we got a bunch of amendments. All right, go for it. Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. This is floor amendment number two, and this is a, this amendment increases. Opposed, no. Motion passes. We'll go to floor amendment number three. Councilor Pena. Mr. President, um, floor member, amendment number three is a technical adjustment to R23 190 101, appropriating the funds to fund 265 to the economic. Uh, 
Um, discussion, those in favor say yes, raise your hand, yes. Those opposed, no. Uh, floor amendment number four, these are all in your iPads by the way as well. Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, floor amendment number four is um, appropriate federal funding from New Mexico DOT for the AMPA uh, wide bike facilities program, ongoing program to promote on street um, bikeway activities, facilities and programs as federal funds to the fiscal year 2024 um, funding to the existing AMPA um, wide bike program. I moved and seconded by Councilor Grout. Discussion on, on Amendment 4. It's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, floor Amendment number 5, Councilor Fiebercorn. Mr. President, I'm not moving floor. No, amendment okay. Five. All right. Uh, anyone sign up to speak on this bill? We have one speaker, Mr. President. That speaker is Andrea Calderon. Hi, sorry, I'm speaking again. Hate to belabor the meeting. I know you all have been here for a minute, but um, I just wanted to, um, you know, I, this is a really interesting time to see sort of like an, uh, some changes to a CIP bill that had already been um, approved previously. Um, something that, you know, um, I keep hearing about time and time again in my community, um, I live on the 4th Street corridor, is, um, you know, the lack of places for people to go use the bathroom, right? And Last council meeting, you all passed the human feces bill, which really, we really appreciated. Um, it was a hundred thousand dollar allocation for something that's going to last until July, um, which is a great start, right? Um, but I think that if we um, are making some changes to um, capital projects, I would really encourage that we look at more permanent solutions um, to the issue of human feces. Um, we're in the budget cycle right now. I think this is a really great opportunity to think about, you know, what that could look like infrastructure-wise, and whether that is, um, you know, actually putting in public toilets. There are some designs that include self-cleaning toilets that are really interesting, or actually funding a nonprofit to have like mobile units um, to actually provide those facilities um, in movable trailers along with showers and clothes washing stations, which I think would provide a more um, sanitary. Um, environment in general and then just support those um, in need. Um, I think those kind of facilities would be helpful for tourists, for students, for folks that are taking the bus regularly. Um, and just, you know, I mean, honestly, my friends, you know, I've had a couple of pregnant friends, they can't find anywhere to pee. You know what I'm saying? You're, if you're holding a baby and you're eight months pregnant, you need to go to the bathroom. So I'm just, you know, I think this is just like a general um, interest of the public, of folks um, across all different lived experiences right now. Um, Las Cruces actually just got a state appropriation for $500,000 for each toilet. Um, so there is sort of like some precedent there in terms of installing those in New Mexican cities. So I would just encourage you to look into that. Thank you. Thank you. That was our lone speaker, Mr. President. Okay, councilors, I believe you all have one more uh, floor amendment. This would be floor amendment number five. So, uh, the sponsors. Mr. President. Um, Council Person. Did you say four? This is four? Uh, five. five. I'd like to move amendment five on page three after line 15, add the following. Uh, the following programs and projects are designated solely for the Youth Navigation Center campus and or youth shelter in Albuquerque. Expenses related to this property are permitted without prior approval provided they are exclusively for this location. However, this authorization does not encompass the conversion of the property into transitional housing solely for the purpose of meeting the 5,000 5, units in five years goal. It goes into the um, appropriations, and then the scope is to acquire rights of way and land for and to plan, design, construct, furnish, install, and equip, and otherwise improve a youth navigation center campus and or youth shelter to provide temporary housing for youth in Albuquerque. We wanted to make sure to clearly define the use of the specific program within the city's CIP for the purchase of this particular property and all the expenses that have been encumbered and, and accumulated to date and that we will keep continuing to accumulate for this specific vision property and project. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to legislate that so that we can make sure to be all very clear on, on what's, what's the funding for this versus um, maybe a potential other facility in Albuquerque that still will help with housing, but not necessarily specific to this project. Okay. <clears throat> well, this is Amendment 5. It's been moved and seconded. Council, any discussion? Okay, we're going to vote. Um, 
Those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Uh, back in the bill, administration, any comments on this bill? Okay. Um, so, we're back in the bill. It's been moved and seconded and amended five times. Uh, sponsors, anything else? All right, we'll go to a vote. Uh, this is, again, um, R24-8. Those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Those opposed, no. Motion passes. Item E is R19, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. R19 is establishing the Route 66 Centennial Celebration 2025-2026 project plan as a policy plan um, designating the Department of Arts and Culture as a project plan coordinator directing the Department of Arts and Culture to provide a City Council with quarterly updates per R23-175 and R24-11. I, I move it to pass. Okay, moved and seconded by Vice President Grout. Uh, anybody sign up to speak on this? No, Mr. President. No. Nope. Uh, administration, any comments on it? Uh, Councilors, any discussion on it? Councilor Rogers? Thank you, Mr. President. I just had a question in reading the outline of the plan from Arts and Culture. They, uh, they had $100,000 for the project plan coordinator. Do you know if that's for both of years or is that just for one? Is this 25, 26, or is that 50,000 for each year or 100,000 for both? Like, what's the salary for that person? Director Santos. Council President, Councilor Rogers, um, it's about $100,000 per year for project management. That includes one full time staff who's dedicated to all the projects as well as some um, supporting contracts for different components of, you know, all the different things that are going on. 